Hello, and welcome to the Being Human podcast, where we explore what it means to be human, physically, mentally, and spiritually. We upload an episode of this podcast every single week. So whether you're new here, or if you're returning and you haven't yet, make sure to hit that subscribe button. You do not want to miss any of these episodes. On this episode of the podcast, I sat down with Jack Lawrence. Jack is an online content creator whose content revolves around philosophy and physics. Jack studied natural sciences at Cambridge University for his undergraduate degree. After taking a gap year, he then studied his postgraduate degree at Oxford University, where he studied the philosophy of physics. So Jack is a very educated man, especially in the areas of philosophy and physics. This really was a heavily existential episode, which is what we're about here at Being Human. We really delved to the depths, really delved into the details. My mind was blown countless times throughout this episode. I had so much food for thought to take away from it. Went into classic philosophical, physical topics such as determinism versus free will. Do we actually have free will? Is life completely determined? Is destiny a thing? Are we actually able to alter the course of our lives? This was something I always thought of as a philosophical spiritual debate, but it is heavily rooted in physics as well. Jack talked about whether there's a multiverse, whether that's possible, what physics has to say about the existence of a multiverse. I asked Jack whether the laws of physics prohibit the existence of God. I asked him, what is God? Does he believe in God? What's the meaning of life? Jack gave us his top three philosophies for navigating life. Jack told us the five philosophers he would invite to his dinner party. And as well, he gave some really interesting, some fun insights into what life is like at Oxford and Cambridge. This episode really was what being human is all about. Incredibly existential, so much to learn and to think about when listening to this. I do not doubt you'll find immense value and probably take away a great deal of confusion with that value. If you enjoyed the conversation, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Give this video a thumbs up drop a comment below, share it around on social media as well. Thank you for watching, thank you for listening, and thank you for supporting Being Human. The Being Human podcast is brought to you by Mr. Bassett's Grappler's Coffee. You do not need to be a grappler to drink it. This is simply great coffee for anyone who loves to get caffeinated. It's incredibly potent, but has a very smooth taste. So if you're a coffee drinker that's looking for a great tasting coffee that does the job, that gets you firing on all cylinders, physically and mentally, head over to mrbassets.com and use the code WAG10 to get 10% off your order. And who knows, drinking it may even invigorate you to try out jiu-jitsu, which would be a great addition to your life as well. And now presenting Being Human with Jack Lawrence. I mean, these tend to be unedited all the way through. Yeah. So warts and all. All right. That's how we're doing it. <laughs> Everything's in. Let's start at the very start. When was Jack Lawrence the, you know, sophisticate born, and how did he become this philosopher, this intellectual that we know now? Uh, well, that's a very kind description. <laughs> I, I would try not to push back against that. It's very flattering. Uh, when was I born? I mean, technically, um, 1994. So turned 30 this year. Uh, born and raised West London. Uh, yeah, I've got a sister, a couple of fantastic parents. I would say in terms of uh, interest in philosophy or potentially being a bit too verbose, my family are a very chatty family. My father was a journalist and so and worked as an editor for the majority of his career. So I grew up with basically every second sentence I wrote being corrected. So that probably contributed to something of it. Uh, as for interest in philosophy and, and everything else, I, I think I've just liked that. I had some really amazing teachers who um, just really sort of lit a fire of interest within, within me for that. Uh, I happened to encounter a few books along the way, which I'm happy to talk about if you want, which sort of connected philosophy to other things. And uh, I sort of saw it as a, um, yeah, this way of thinking about the world, which was relevant to basically every part of it uh, and was fun to do, fun to consider. Uh, and so I guess a huge combination of luck, some really positive influences, uh, good teachers, uh, and yeah, you have the monstrosity you see before you today. <laughs> so when was that uh, inflection point, so to speak, that first philosophical reading book that you read that really sparked your interest? Gosh, uh, probably 14, 15. Uh, I remember I had just in school, um, sort of religious studies, questions around God and all that, and... Um, 
I was raised secular. My dad, um, he's from a sort of Irish Catholic family, uh, but he sort of gave up his faith before I was born. I think my mother is sort of nebulously Church of England, but we, we really didn't discuss religion a lot in my family. And I remember uh, in my primary school, we, we sang hymns and, and it was, you know, it was sort of Christian. And at that sort of age, first coming across the sort of, and I think probably it was like an edgy atheist stage. Like I came across uh, Dawkins, a bit of Tim Minchin at the right time, uh, along with discussions in class about, you know, problem of evil and just, you know, lots of stuff where religion's just a bit strange. Um, didn't, anticipate, <laughs> didn't anticipate that. Um, and so... The, the one gust yeah. of wind that's in yeah. London today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only breeze uh, has, has arrived. But yeah, so pro probably that. So I had an edgy atheist at stage, uh, 15, 16. I can't give you one single book uh, or thinker or teacher. Again, it was like probably a combination of things. But I remember uh, probably around 14 or 15 deciding I didn't believe in God. That's probably the start of it, as I imagine it is for a lot of people. Um, not that I had a huge faith beforehand. Uh, and then identifying myself as someone who didn't believe in God uh, and seeing people who did believe in God as, uh, as making a crucial mistake. Um, I've suffered on my views considerably since then. But yeah, that was probably the beginning of it. So. Okay, and uh, had you? What was your formal study of philosophy like at this time? Were you, were you studying? For, I mean, philosophy is not really a GCSE that's covered in many schools. Yeah, 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 yeah. Religion, uh, religious studies in G GCSE. It's probably changed now because, you know, uh, as mentioned, I am old. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there was, there was some philosophy in it. I think you know we talked about like Plato's allegory of the cave. Um, you definitely do talk about the problem of evil. Uh, you know, how can all loving, all powerful, all knowing God uh, allow bad things to happen? So there's inklings of it. Um, when I was 16, 17, I did, you may know, a bit of the EPQ, Extended Project Qualification, yes, A-level. Yeah. So it's basically you write a dissertation on anything you like. And at that time, maybe I'll take a few steps back. Another key thing, which I've, I've sort of not given enough credit to at the moment, was um, in my school we had a debating society. And I was really lucky in that me and a couple of other people in my year, we were, I think, in year nine, and there was a sixth former who uh, was a really accomplished debater who happened to sort of swing by the sort of year nine debating club, as it were, the middle school debating club, um, and picked us out and said, you guys are really good, I'd like to coach you, because competitive debating, uh, it's certainly in London schools and schools across the UK, is a thing that happens. Um, it's not as glamorous as sport, but it's a thing. And uh, I suddenly had this person who, A, said, you know, I was sort of like intelligent in that way, and B, was a lot better read than I was. And uh, he encouraged me to read things like On Liberty by J.S. Mill, which is like a piece of political philosophy, a really um, important one, uh, and start thinking about things in that. So that was probably a, a, a crucial influence. And then from there, um, he wanted to study PPE at Oxford, and he did. And that got me into the thinking of like, oh, maybe I could maybe I could go try and study something like that there. And I was really into physics, and I found out there was a course called Physics and Philosophy, and I went, bingo, those are the two things I like. Uh, ended up doing this EPQ choice, writing dissertation, and I read, among other things, book a book called The Fabric of Reality by David Deutsch, which sort of stressed, among other things, the importance of philosophy, particularly philosophy of science, to the scientific enterprise. So I guess I had a variety of things being like, oh, philosophy is really important to how people live their lives, their religion. It's important to how we run society and politics. It's important to science. Philosophy is this common denominator, and yeah, I just I found it very interesting. Hmm. And that's what you went on to go and study, the philosophy and physics degree? No, so I didn't get in. So, this okay. is, uh, so um, I, I applied to do philosophy and physics at Oxford uh, in undergrad, and um, they had the uh, physics assessment test, the PAT test, or at least they may have changed it by now, but um, to get in, I had my sort of first panic attack when doing that. Didn't really know what was happening, but I studied. I was so intent on getting in. Um, it's a two-hour exam, and I remember for the first hour and 15 minutes, I, I just didn't write anything. I was looking at the words, but nothing was going in. That's the best way I can explain it. Was like, it's like I'd forgotten how to read. It was very peculiar. Anyway, I sort of got over it, did what I could in the last 45 minutes and uh, didn't, didn't make it to interview. I emailed them and I asked for feedback. I said, oh, you know, how did, how did I do? And they said, uh, I got an email back saying, you're one point below the cutoff for interview. So I printed off the email, stuck it on my wall because I was like, Ugh! you know, so then I just like, I thought, okay, I'll just do my best at A-level. And there were some other courses in the country that did physics and philosophy. Uh, and then when I got my A-level results, I did pretty well. And so I thought I might take a year out and then apply to Cambridge just to do natural sciences, so to do straight physics, because I, I sort of wanted to be in that sort of really intense environment. I thought I was good enough, or I might be good enough. Um, so I took a gap year, did that application, and then got into Cambridge. And then within that, 
did some philosophy modules, and then eventually, at master's level, went back to Oxford and did uh, the philosophy of physics. So I eventually had my way, but it was a roundabout uh, full of setbacks. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, on the plus side, though, you got to experience both Cambridge and Oxford. Yeah, I'm that guy. Yeah. 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 So wow. It's maximum pretentiousness. <laughs> yeah. No one likes me. When they, yeah, it's a whole thing. Um, Talk to me about Cambridge and Oxford, because to the rest of us mortals that didn't go to Cambridge or Oxford, we look at it. it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I've, you know, uh, I've got a couple of friends that uh, I came to know through law that went to Cambridge or Oxford. And um, when they talk about it, they're not even trying to talk about it in a pretentious way, but it's so clear that it's incredibly different to any other university experience, or I suppose any other studying experience in the UK. It's very, not just traditional, I don't want to say cult-like. G- oh, give me, give me, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it, it self-perpetuates that reputation. Uh, so there are a lot of weird rituals. I mean, uh, there are so many things I could say. So I, I think starters... Uh, let's look at these sort of fundamentals, which are um, for undergrad, they have eight week terms as opposed to 12 week terms. And I think there are some boards across the UK, which basically standardize the worth of a degree. And so they want to make sure that say a physics degree from one university is kind of worth the same as a physics degree from another university, um, which sort of makes sense that that would exist. Right. Uh, and so right off the bat, you're studying material in less time. So you've got uh, what well, a cut down of 33% there. Uh, so that's going to in- increase the intensity. You've also got it, it self-selects because of this reputation that perpetuates for people. They say, oh, you've got to really love it to come here. You've got to really be passionate about it. You've got to be really hardcore. And yes, there are family ties, but pretty much anyone who goes there is by definition pretty self-motivated, pretty competitive, and generally quite clever. Now, both Cambridge and Oxford know that there are more people who can do their courses than they have places for them. So genuinely, some of the smartest people I know didn't get in and just got unlucky at interviews. So there is an enormous amount of luck getting in. If you get the interviewer and they don't like you and they don't click, tough luck. You didn't control that. You can be the smartest person in the world if they just don't like you. Um, you know, you, you won't get offered a place. I mean, perhaps that's a disingenuous way of saying it, but um, what the interviewer is trying to look for, generally the person interviewing you will be the person supervising you or giving you tutorials, that sort of one-on-one or one-on-three um, <clears throat> time where they're teaching you. So if they don't think you respond well to that style of teaching, they may not offer you a place, not because they don't think you're smart, but because they go, well, look, a lot of this course is predicated on you reacting well to this environment. So if you if you don't like the style of like back and forth, you genuinely <laughs> might may not like enjoy it here. So yeah, um, <clears throat> other things. So to to maybe like make it less crazy enchanting, the laws of physics I studied at Cambridge are the same laws of physics that anyone studies at any other physics degree. Like they're not harder. <laughs> they're not. Having, they're not special yeah, laws. They're not of special physics. laws, right? So in the same way, I would hope the law you study, <laughs> like UK law, would be the same you study any other degree. So it's also it's the circumstances. So in terms of deadlines, I would have across random assignments four or five deadlines a week, whereas I would hear like friends at other universities where they'd have one or two a term, right? So it's just a different intensity. Does it produce better outcomes in terms of like academic research? But to what extent smart people just go there in the first place? I don't know. I would really like, I think it would be much more interesting to have a university ranking based on how good is someone when they arrive and how, how much distance do they travel from where they left? Because say you asked me to coach Usain Bolt in sprinting for a week, right? I don't know anything about that. But he's going to be pretty fast when, when I'm done with him, even if I don't do anything. Because guess what? I was coaching Usain Bolt, not saying that I'm that good. But right, if you get a bunch of people who are incredibly smart at a place who are self-motivated and they end doing really well, well, that's crazy, man. That's so great. That's, this must be the best university in the world. Or you've got a bunch of people who are already with that, that driven. Not saying there aren't good teachers there. But anyway, I'm sort of all over the place with this answer. But um, so I think that puts it a little bit in context. You are kind of studying the same things, but there are more demands on you. You've got a less amount of time. You've got a generally a very driven group of people. There's an enormous amount of luck there. And then you've got, as you mentioned, these really sort of archaic um, cultural artifacts, which are propped up and sort of give the university an identity. Um, I can elaborate on any of that, but yeah, I don't want to ramble too much. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about the colleges. Cause that's something that's not present in any other universities other than Cambridge and Oxford from as far as I'm aware, which college were you in at Cambridge and talk to me about how those colleges work, and what their purpose is. Yeah. So I was at Homerton college in Cambridge and then when I did the master at Oxford, I was at Balliol. So in order to attend the university and study there, you need to be a member of a college. Uh, again, I, I probably, uh, 
more romantic than uh, is it ought to be example is in the same way like with Hogwarts <clears throat> in order to be a student there you have to be a member of one of the four houses right um, the college uh, the colleges together make up the university so <clears throat> another way is in order to be to live in the United States you have to live in a state and together they are the USA uh, so the college everyone studies if you're studying physics um, we were both studying physics but we are at different colleges we would have the same lectures we would take the same exams um, but the main thing that would differ uh, for each of us is that the where we live, our sort of dormitories, will be different because we're different college grounds. Um, our access, in some cases, to bursaries and grants will be different. Uh, the people who do the supervisions or tutorials, those sort of, you know, like I said, one on one or one on three, whatever lessons, will be different because they'll generally be staff within the college. Your access sometimes to different facilities will be different because sometimes colleges on site will have a swimming pool or a gym, and some won't, um, and all of that. So on, one, on the one hand, the sort of colleges on your side, they're the sort of pastoral looking after you, um, making sure uh, that you're registered for things kind of thing. And then there's like this overarching university body, which is setting the exams, deciding the lecture timetables and all that. And that will be like the physics department. Um, so yeah, which college you go to will, to a large extent, change your experience of the university. Um, some colleges are vastly more richer uh, vastly more rich, I should say, than others. So Hamilton's a relatively new college, um, not that rich, um, slightly out of town, had a lot of space, it was great, had a wonderful time. <clears throat> but, uh, and there's a lot of student journalism that was done on this when I was there, and I'm sure perhaps it's changed, but um, in terms of just the amount of wealth, because they are independent legal entity, entities, <clears throat> places like Trinity College um, will have exorbitant amount of wealth to spend on things and students and, and grants, whereas, um, other colleges may not. So, so that's it. So ultimately, if someone's applying to these places, I would say don't worry too much about a college. The advice is sort of like go to open days, see um, what takes your fancy. Some colleges are known for specializing in certain subjects. So Trinity is known as like the one to go to for maths. And again, that sort of becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. Researchers or academics who know Trinity is good for maths, they want to go there to teach, which attracts more students and such and so on. Um, some colleges know for really being good at chemistry and so on. Sometimes that's just because they're close to the department. So there's a lot of sort of nuances. All I'd say is if the college teaches your subject, you go there and you have it and you vibe with it well, um, then you should apply. Uh, it shouldn't affect your application too much. Um, but uh, and, and ultimately, almost everyone decides that the college they went to is like the best ever. Uh, the only, I think, significant difference is there are some female only colleges, which for some people might be important for religious reasons. Um, so obviously that will be significant. But no male only colleges. It's not to my knowledge. There's definitely one in Oxford, uh, which I think has like six people. Mm. I'm but surprised that's still allowed. So, uh, I bet the... But it's a religious thing. It's like, a, it's, okay. like it's, it's tied up with like, um, I think it's like a, a Christian sect. Right. Some kind. Uh, so, yeah. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, sorry if that's, I hope that's the information you were... No, 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 definitely. Because mm -hmm. I, I think it's... Yeah, it's, it's funny, the, uh, you used the example of Harry Potter, and I think probably because a lot of Harry Potter was shot at Oxford and Cambridge. Yeah, Christchurch specifically is the hall where... Yeah, um, yeah, oh, yeah okay. You can go visit it. Uh, so they, um, they charge people to do tours through, through the mm. college, but the, um, the big hall scene that's, um, that was done in that, that college. So if you're a fan, Harry Potter fan, check out it. We'll go to Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there uh, certainly seems to be uh, a parallel that people draw in their minds. It's an immersive experience. It's, you know, kind of archaic, very traditional. It's got its own rules and it's almost detached from the rest of the world. So it's, it's very interesting to hear about. In terms of your actual study then at Cambridge, was it straight physics that you ended up doing? So I did the course called Natural Sciences, uh, which they say is the largest course at Cambridge, and that's just because they lump all science courses on together under this one name. Okay. So the way Natural Sciences works is in the first year, you have to pick four subjects, one form of mathematics, and three sciences. So uh, I did uh, basically maths physicist, essentially. I uh, did one called maths B, um, physics, Earth sciences and material sciences, but um, so I know did maths for biologists, uh, did evolutionary biology, um, physiology, and chemistry. So all of that. Second year you'll specialize further. So that year I did physics, physics, maths, and then third year you generally pick one thing. So I did physics, but I was also able to do this option where I took some uh, some studies in the philosophy of science and the history of science. Oh, okay. So that was 
my my course. So the, if people ask me, I'm different. Like, I study physics, but technically, I did physics within natural sciences. And anyone who studied any science at Cambridge will have done natural sciences, but would have picked a subject within that. So yeah, the philosophy of science. Yeah. Obviously, the original degree <clears throat> you wanted you wanted to do was physics and philosophy. Yes. There is this relationship between physics and philosophy, more so than any other science, I'd say, right? Uh, potentially, I think, uh, to, the, to the extent that physics has, may, may inspire like awe and wonder more than, well, I'm not sure, but to, to me it seems more natural, but um, potentially I, I, would, I wouldn't force that point. But yeah, sorry, I didn't interrupt you. So no, no, I, that's what I was going to ask. What's your view on the relationships with physics and philosophy? Because the way I see it, because people that are interested in philosophy tend to have some kind of interest in physics, and people that are really into physics tend to think quite philosophically. I mean, I suppose my flaw in this is I'm absolutely abhorrent when it comes to physics, maths, anything like that, and I spend quite a lot of time, you know, philosophizing. Um, but yeah, w what's that relationship? Is it just because, I mean, physics, it, that's the core of science, right? You've got biology broken down into chemistry, broken down into physics. Physics is the base of existence. And is it because of that existentialness to physics that ties it to the study of philosophy? Gosh, um, I think there's a lot There's a lot to unpack there. Um, some people would certainly agree with you uh, on that. Um, so taking a step back, um, science came out of a branch of philosophy called natural philosophy. Um, so to be a natural philosopher before the word science was even really coined or scientists was even coined, that's what natural philosophy oh, was. Okay. It's the study of the world. Wow. Um, so really, if in some sense, all of science is an offshoot from philosophy. Um, and one of, the, one of the arguments of why philosophy isn't as important now is that essentially all of its children have grown up <laughs> and we don't need the grandfather anymore or the grandparent. Um, is physics more fundamental? It depends. So this, this is a view called reductionism where basically you say, well, the, the fundamental building blocks blocks are um, we can we can learn everything if we knew everything about atoms and particles we could understand everything about the universe from first principles um, <clears throat> this uh, doesn't seem to necessarily be true because there's this thing called emergence which is where sort of higher level um, complexity arises seemingly um, which is really hard to explain in terms of uh, lower level uh, rules so as an example um, if someone to ask you, and I think it's the, I can't remember which philosopher came up with this thought experiment, but if someone said to you, um, why is there a copper atom at the tip of the uh, nose of the statue of Winston Churchill? The sort of fundamental answer in physics terms is like, well, forces came about to, uh, like maybe that, that atom was uh, forged in a star, and like, well, I guess like enough force was like moved that atom there, and that's why it's there. But that doesn't really doesn't really give us that's like, not the answer, answer you're what, looking what, for what, with that what question. someone's asked probably a better explanation is like well why was copper picked for this statue why winston churchill right but these are it's really hard to give a sort of particle based explanation for why winston churchill is an, an important historical figure um so that's why some people might push back on the idea of like you know small thing most important thing um within physics um so in terms of the overlap um i would say you know philosophy is the study of wisdom uh philosophy of science has a broad field seeks to understand uh, ans ask and answer questions like uh, what is science what makes scientific knowledge different from other kinds of knowledge is it different from other kinds of knowledge um, what is the scientific method is there a scientific method can we improve the scientific method um, how can we know things for sure science is proven wrong all the time um, how can we be confident in scientific predictions every past scientific theory we've ever had has been proven wrong chances are Right now, what we believe will be proven wrong in the future. So why should we trust in it? Those sorts of questions. Philosophy of physics is within that, and you look at more specific questions to do with current understandings of physics, so stuff like what is time? Lots of our physical theories have disagreements, but they both work. That's kind of weird. Maybe we should talk about that. Um, uh, and then you've got questions like what makes for a good experiment? How much evidence do you need before you change your mind about something? Those sorts of things. And I think those questions are pertinent to pretty much every um, form of science, sometimes more so. So one of the really nice things about um, physics is you get to is isolate things. So you know, electrons are really nice in that they seem like you know fairly fairly fundamental um, uh, particles. Whereas if you're studying people, gosh, you know how do you how do you study people? I mean, like you know, 
black holes, you only need three numbers to describe them. People? God. I mean, in some sense, physics is like the easiest science in terms of like refining mm. complexity. I suppose it's the so. most reliable, right? Is that a fair statement? <clears throat> oh, gosh, it depends what you mean by reliable. What do you mean <laughs> yeah. by reliable? Um, changes the least. Or, or it's... Arguably, you say physics has changed the most. Okay. So, um, uh, so you know, again, it depends on... If you're, if you're writing a book about the history of science, you're kind of in a, in a bind because when was quote-unquote science invented? Um, so you might say, like, generally the earliest West, Western scientist, we would say, was Aristotle, because um, he was the first philosopher to sort of say, mm, maybe we shouldn't just think about things, and if they're really nice in our heads, uh, believe them, we should study the, the natural world. Um, it's kind of unfair, Plato did look at the natural world, but that was like his emphasis. Um, and him and his students did a lot of things of like looking at like botanicals and stuff like that, and he wrote extensively, and he sort of he was probably one of the first Western people to write down extensive observations of the natural world. And he had theories around like gravity. I think he said that things fall down because they want to um, be in their sort of like natural places at the center of the earth or something like that. Kind of like the first theory of gravity in a way of like an explanation. Um, in terms of like how far we changed from that, um, we changed, again, depends on what you want to argue, but like quite a lot. We've had Newton come around and say, you know, time runs at the same rate in all places. Um, he said, I don't know why gravity works this way. This is just how it works. So in, in a way, he was answering fewer questions. He was just saying, this is just a dis description. I don't know why. It just works this way. Um, uh, but, you know, previously we had, obviously, the idea that the Earth was the center of the universe. And then we had Copernicus and the heliocentric theory. We had the sun being at the center of the universe. That's a pretty big... If you talk, talk about changing your mind, that's a pretty big change of mind, you know? Uh, and then Einstein comes along and says, dude, even time is relative. So I would say arguably physics has changed the most, you could say, because if you were taking any of these historical figures and explaining to them what we believe about physics now, you know, you talk about quantum physics, I mean, God, even the people who invented that didn't like it. So, um, yeah, whereas like, um, but, you know, biology and chemistry, there's lots of discoveries. So, um, so yeah, reliable, I don't know. I don't know. I think in terms of the other way you might say that word, which is, can we trust the predictions of physics? Um, possibly, but again, there's loads of caveats around that. Mm. Um, so can you bet on it more? Can you bet on the laws of physics more than, you know, laws so, of chemistry? Yeah. Yeah, hard. Really, that's like, that's like one of the fundamental questions of like the philosophy of science, right? Can we trust other laws of physics more reliable for predictions than laws of chemistry or biology? That's like a really hard question to answer. Um, Depends which law. Okay, so the area of science which most people think is going to be unchanged for the next 100 years is thermodynamics. And that's because that's the one that says like entropy only increases. Um, it's to do with basically how um, useful energy turns into not useful energy or like the flow of energy, if you like. The reason why people bet on that is that it has some really, really few assumptions and it seems to apply at all levels of observation. So it applies on the levels of galaxies, like the universe as a whole, um, but it also it's, applies in this room for like how mm. heat like flows through it. And everything Buys like for humans, calories in, calories out. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So if you're if we were like doing like sweepstakes here, or like doing some bets, thermodynamics, that'd probably be like a pretty good bet. Um, gravity depends what prediction. If you're saying, hey Jack, if I drop something in ten years, will it fall down? I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly fairly sure of that, but. Um, if you're talking about some like obscure prediction about black holes, I don't know. They're, like they're sort of still up for grabs. Um, the problem you've sort of basically um, gestured towards is this something called the problem of induction, um, which is do you know inductive logic? You no. Know? So um, deductive logic is where the conclusion necessarily follows, follows from the premises. That would be all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. So if those first two statements are true, the conclusion has to be true. Inductive logic is kind of more guessing a rule based on evidence. So it's saying like, I've seen every time I press this button, this light turns on. Um, therefore I infer that me pressing this button turns on the light. That's it. It doesn't necessarily mean true. There could be something else turning on the light, but we've seen it a lot and we think it's true. So we're, we're inducing that's gonna, main, that's gonna be true forever. So the other way of saying this is like, I've seen B follow A in every alphabet I've seen. Therefore I think it's a rule that B follows A. Um, you may be wrong. So, uh, like an example of where um, uh, 
so it seems like science, um, worryingly to a lot of philosophers, uses inductive logic because you know we don't have access to any cosmic rule book. We're just saying, well, look, every time I drop something, it falls. So I think it's a law that like things fall when you drop them. It could be that after a certain amount of time or in different conditions, that doesn't hold true. So Richard Feynman um, had the analogy that we're learning physics in the same way someone's learning chess by watching people to play chess. You be ch ch chess player? You, you uh, at a very play, basic you, level. Basic. Very like, basic ima level. Imagine someone was watching, uh, a, you know, they watched 10 chess games, but they'd never seen, I don't know what, what you call it, but the castling move where they move the king would be. Yeah. Imagine they hadn't seen any that for the first 10 games. And on the 11th game, they see it and they're like, what the? Yeah. Two, <laughs> yeah. two pieces are moving at once. That's against the rules of chess. Um, you couldn't predict that, right? Um, or we can imagine that maybe, you know, if they're watching some other game, uh, and let's say there's a version of chess where after 20 moves, um, pawns can suddenly move diagonally, right? And maybe all the games they've ever seen have only gotten to move 19, right? It could be the case that in our universe, say, like, after a certain amount of time, one of the laws changes. Mm. We don't know that. Gosh, that's a real worrying issue. Like, you know, um, so this is like a big problem in, philosophy, in the philosophy of science, and some people think that it's been solved, some people don't, which is um, how can we have faith in scientific predictions? Because we have to, it seems, do a sort of induction, a bit, bit of logic where we're saying the future is going to look like the past. We have no guarantee that that's the case. So, yeah, sorry, probably, again, a bit of a meandering answer, but I hope No, that no, sense. no, uh, that was very insightful. And my question is probably a stupid one. Is... That would be... Is in, isn't inductive logic or deductive logic, sorry, based off of some kind of inductive logic? So you use the example deductive logic, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore he is mortal. The, fact, the statement that all men are mortal is based on inductive yeah, logic of every we have seen, seen so every man it. die. Very, no, no, <laughs> fantastic question, fantastic, fantastic insight. So some... Uh, deductive logic you can do from statements you define to be true. So you might be say like, one plus two is three. I define what one is, and I define what two is. So by definition, it has to be three. Now again, a philosopher of maths might dispute that statement. But you basically the observation you've hit on, which is, is sort of like, I would say, following on from your question, um, with any statement, so this is a problem, which I'm not going to butcher the name, but it's called like the Munch Chasen trilemma or something like that. It's a German phrase. And the philosopher Karl Popper wrote about it. But um, the trilemma is, is this, which is um, to prove any statement to be true, we either have to assume it's true. That's not a proof. We have to prove it's true through some sort of deduction. But then we have to rely on something else being true. And then we sort of fall back a step. It's kind of like regression. It's like, you know, mm. who, who made God kind of thing. Um, so we either prove it true, uh, assume it's true, or the third one, uh, which is, uh, I can't remember the third one, like have some sort of evidence like that, or, but then we have to like dispute that. But basically, you always have to make some sort of assumption. There's no uh, like self-justifying epistemology. At some point, you'd have to be like, I guess we just kind of assume that this is true so we can build and start doing stuff. So you're absolutely right. Um, you, you could even make the argument that like de deductive logic outside of like, mathematical systems doesn't really apply in the real world because like well what can we be absolutely certain about um and very quickly this like spirals down into like oh my god is this real uh what, what is real subjective reality type stuff so yes i would say that's a good question uh, a lot of deductive claims are fundamentally based on some sort of like inductive one um so let's take another one which is saying something like um uh this guy has a peanut allergy uh he just ate a peanut Therefore, he's going to have an allergic reaction. So this guy's a peanut allergy. Well, is that an inductive um, statement? It might be, because previously he's had a peanut and like, he's saw that. Um, he's just eaten a peanut. Doesn't Is that inductive? We've kind of seen it happen. Um, we, we might say that's an observation. That's an empirical fact. Um, uh, we might hope that maybe we can have an empirical fact about allergy. Maybe we can test for it genetically. Or that we can maybe we can say that there has been a test. So, you know, there are, uh, there are other avenues um, for that. But then you're, you're, again, you're relying on some sort of scientific method like empiricism. We have got a result, we've got a test, we've got evidence. So, yeah, um, all of knowledge is uh, subject to criticism. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> this, is, this is the world I live in. I was just thinking, we exist on... Well, everything we do every day, not everything, but to an extent is an assumption, right? We're going through life. You make a lot of assumptions, yeah. Um... 
and and we take all these assumptions we're making as fact and for the most part they're very reliable but then when you start delving into it you your mind quickly starts to blow and you feel you know like you've just dropped five grams of <laughs> mushrooms yeah 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 well if, i think uh, so for me the classic one is um physics tells us that most anything made of atoms or molecules is mostly empty space right um so you know uh, these microphones our, our bodies uh, mostly empty space now day to day i'm not thinking oh i'm made of empty space i'm thinking of things as solid so the operating system the heuristics the assumptions we have to use in our sort of like flesh skeletons flesh covered skeletons to uh, get through the day are going to correlate with what's true insofar as it's useful and we can think about it um but yeah when you get down to the nitty-gritty of what's like capital t true then yeah things like the universe is a very strange place and i think it's a really interesting philosophical problem is um, straddling that line of to what extent do I want to live in the quote unquote like objectively true world and to what extent do I want to make assumptions about it that might sort of be deceptive or leave information out but allow me to better thrive in it so I guess a more pertinent one maybe like someone who thinks of themselves as above average in attractiveness right arguably there's an objective answer to that so if we polled all the people in the world and said like how attractive is this person we would imagine they'd rank somewhere and maybe they'd be above average, maybe they wouldn't, depending on whatever you want to define attractiveness as. But then believing that they're above average in attractiveness probably contributes to them being more attractive, if they're more confident, if they're more outgoing, if they smile more. So this belief is a sort of, maybe initially a deception and not objectively true, but turns into one which sort of becomes true, mm. which is really, and that's I think like a, a, a an odd thing to do as like a person in the world, um, which, I think this is sort of where philosophy may like intersect a little bit with the sort of self-help, self-development space where, um, yeah, you, uh, whether you consciously self uh, like deceive yourself or you have beliefs, which like benefit you, um, that sort of leads into it in the same way that like I will day to day think of things as solid because it's useful to me, even though it's not like true, true. So again, I hope that made some sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. To go back to your studies at Cambridge. Yeah. So your final year was, Pure physics. Final year, uh, uh, I had physics, but I was doing some um, studies in the philosophy and history. Of science. Sorry, yes, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I had like I kind of thought I cracked it because I had lectures on for one for a few weeks. I had lectures on quantum physics in the morning, and then in the evening I had lectures on the occult. And I was like, <laughs> no one is doing university better than I am right now. This is amazing. So yeah. Looking back over your three years at Cambridge, and I suppose you can do it on the on the level of your actual studies and then on the level of your experience of university as a whole, what were the main conclusions you'd made either about physics, philosophy or about life? Gosh, uh, main conclusions. Or I say conclusions, or maybe they were just questions, <laughs> which yeah, yeah. often well, the, the seems joke, to be the, the case. Joke philosophy, philosophy degrees is that you leave knowing less than when you start, yeah. which, which shouldn't be the case for science. Um, uh, conclusions. I would say uh, broader ones about life, um, I think I was, I think this is not, not necessarily, but there are some people who are, I met some people out there who are just okay, geniuses, straight up, just unfathomably brilliant. And it was very humbling. Um, but there are also just a lot of people who just worked really hard. Uh, and it was comforting in a way, uh, and inspiring just to see a lot of people just put in the hours. I think a lot of people underestimate, uh, how much like quote unquote smart people just study and work on stuff and don't get it at first, but like keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. So I was really lucky in that I had a couple of friends in my college who we became very close and we were all doing physics together. So we'd regularly study together. And these are really smart guys and seeing them not get things initially and then get them. And sometimes I wouldn't get something initially uh, and then eventually get them. That was good. I think there's, there I had a constant panic prior to getting there that I, if I didn't get something, it was sort of evidence that I, I, I wasn't smart enough like this. It was testing some quality um, and that, you know, you had to be above a certain height to enter. But uh, it's, it, it seems like past a certain point, that's just not the case. It's just work. Um, and I think there were definitely people who did better than me who I don't know whether they're smarter or not, but they just worked harder. And so I think there is a fairness in academic success like that, that might correlate a little bit with sporting success where yes, genetics are an important factor and you will have some sort of potential, but also it's just like, do you put in the hours, you know? Um, so that was something I took away from it. Say, another thing I, I sort of eventually took away was how much uh, 
being able to articulate, understand, and regulate your emotional state is really important for study. So I mentioned I had like an anxiety attack when I did that first application to Oxford, which didn't go well. I carried a lot of anxiety with me in my first year of Cambridge, and I really struggled. Like I didn't do, I did okay my first year, but I didn't do great. And a lot of it was because I'd sit at home, I'd be trying to study, and I'd just be panicking. I'd just think, I just don't get this. There's such a mountain of work to do. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Uh, and I think my error was not trying to deal with the anxiety directly and just trying to, I kept getting in this loop of, I was anxious, couldn't study, getting more anxious and such and so forth. And wasn't compassionate to myself of going, of course you're nervous. You're surrounded by all these people who are so competitive and it's all this. So yeah, I think, and it, again, it, it, it's hard to articulate because I do think there's a place for just gritting your teeth and doing something and pushing through. Uh, and I, I think we can overindulge introspection and talking about our feelings to the point where we're just reinforcing them. Um, but either extreme doesn't work. There is certain, certainly some middle ground where it's like, okay, look, I've been nervous for a few days now. It's really making me struggle with doing something. Maybe I should just talk to someone about it. Or like, you know, is there something I can do which like calms me down? Or can I reduce the size of the problem I'm working on and build it back up again? That was a skill which, when I sort of cracked it in my second and third year, I found studying a lot easier. But it made me appreciate, I think there's something called, the name escapes me, there's something where essentially people freak out about maths and they can't do it. And this is a condition that, um, sometimes gets diagnosed in schools where people just see numbers and they freeze up because they've had such bad experiences with them trying to do times tables and they just can't do it. And I suddenly had a real empathy for that. So I went, sometimes that happens to me. Like I've looked at stuff and just not been able to read it and I'm pretty good at maths, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah, so yeah, hard work, anxiety regulation. Uh, yeah, and just, just generally humility, I would say. I, I just met some incredibly smart people um, and... Uh, not that I think I was like a, an arrogant asshole beforehand, but it was really just going like, wow, like, you know, there are some, some great folks out there. I could, yeah, so I could, I could probably come up with more, but those are the ones that come to mind. Mm. But you, I mean, seems like you enjoyed your studies. I had a great life. time. Well, I, I'll say this, I'll say this. I had a great time, but I don't want to overly romanticize Cambridge and Oxford. When I was there, the one of the student newspapers did like a, a, a survey and they came up with a statistic, a statistic, which was something like one in four people while at Cambridge will develop some sort of mental health problem while there. It is hard, and for a lot of people, it doesn't work for them. So I'll, I'll put this out there, which I wrote about when I graduated, and you know, I didn't have any lawyers then, so no one read it. But in my degree, and with a lot of degrees at Cambridge, all of your degree will be decided by your end of year exams in your third year. But there's pros and cons to that. But think about this. You're taking your bet. You're basically saying, if I sign up for this degree, let's say you can get in. I am betting that during a week, three years from now, I will be on good form. And I'll walk out with a good degree. That's a bet. That's a bet. Can you guarantee that in three years you will do well? This is partly why they emphasize good exam grades because you're not, if you can't deal with pressure, again, this is not, there are lots of courses which are more coursework based. Um, that might be way better for you. I had a friend, definitely smarter than me, brilliant bloke, basically got depressed in his last year, last term, um, shut down and sort of walked out with a third. Uh, not because he wasn't smart, not because he hasn't worked hard, he just had a really bad time and he just got like a bit crushed with it. My first year, I lived next to a guy who, again, the anxiety of the place crippled him so much they had sort of repeat first year a few times, eventually graduated, God bless him, he worked really hard, but it was tough, it was really tough. So, um, pressure is great, I enjoyed it, I thrived off of it, um, I certainly had some anxiety, but so glad I did it, wouldn't have had it any other way, but that, not, not everyone would say that. Um, I think a lot of people, and even while there, would lament that they would have been happier or having more fun going to another university where you do have a bit of time to chill. Um, and arguably, maybe I would have been a better physicist had I gone to another university because I would have had time to, more time to mull over problems and think. You know, there was this joke we had where every week we'd have lectures on, you know, some Nobel Prize winning physicist who had come up with this incredible formula. And we'd have to do questions on it by the end of the week. And we'd be saying to each other, this guy was a genius who spent his lifetime coming up with this and we've got to understand it and master it in a few days. What? I'm not a genius. I'm not him. And what? Uh, you know, whereas if we had a few bit more time, maybe that was, would have been a bit easier, but you, you're like guzzling information. Um, and that's hard. It's taxing. It's really taxing. So, uh, yeah, I, I would just put in, put in those uh, caveats. Um, so yeah, I had a, I had a great time. It pushed me. I got everything I wanted out of it. I met some amazing people. I, I it broadened my horizons. 
but equally I don't have a control group. I don't know that I wouldn't have had a better time elsewhere. Um, and there are certainly some people I know who genuinely actively believe they would have had a better time elsewhere. So, and just to clarify, the subject matter you're assessed on for that week at the end of your final year, is that subject matter of the final year of all three years? So in physics, it was that final year. So you have to, you get exams every year. Uh, so this is physics. And if you don't pass them, uh, you get kicked out. There's no retakes. Right, generally. right. So that's one thing. So you can't, you can't dick about. Um, uh, there again, there are extenuating circumstances for some people, but you know, it's, if you're, you're not keeping up. I remember one time in second year, we just finished our, last exams and we were friends with some people in Girton College and we went for dinner there and some guy we met him like a couple of hours after the exam and he was pissed uh, and we were like how have you got drunk so quickly and he was like oh, I was drinking through the exam <laughs> and we were like what are you doing and he failed and he didn't get through the third year oh, and wow. he got kicked out and we were like oh, you know we just didn't I mean there's a lot of other stuff going on I mean again went to another university all turned out okay uh, so so there's that it's slightly different for different courses in third year yeah I think me and my friends worked out that we were examined on approximately like 0.5% of the material that we've been taught during the three years. So um, there is an exam which is well known in fourth year. Uh, if you do the master's version of the physics course, which I didn't do, but a couple of my friends did, called the general paper, where uh, I think it's a two or three hour exam, where they cannot, that basically explicitly they say, we'll ask you on anything we've taught, we've taught you during the four years you've been here. And that's generally considered like a pretty hard paper. Um, but yeah, at least for the three year bachelor's undergrad, it's... Um, specifically third year stuff but you you also incorporate the stuff from uh you've done in the previous years like it does build, build on itself so then from there you decided to do masters at oxford i worked for a year because i so i i oh, well actually i guess this is another conclusion so i went into that course thinking i might become a scientist and i left that course thinking i don't want to become a scientist uh i am probably it's probably a mistake but I remember there was a moment I was walking out of a lecture and my friend Killian, who's one of my best mates, he's brilliant. Uh, and we'd just been learning something called the uh, moment of inertia tensor, which is basically just a fancy way of a bunch of numbers to describe how something spins uh, or how it reacts to forces and makes it spin. Uh, it's like a grid. And um, I remember walking out just going, okay, you know, here's another thing I need to learn for the exam. Big, no big deal. And I remember Killian going, dude, man, that was so cool. Like, the moment of inertia tensor like now I finally get it man and I was like oh you're a physicist I was like oh that's what I meant to have uh, and I also didn't really like lab work lab work was just uh, I just found it it was a pain to try and get the universe to do what you wanted to do really which is actually kind of been true for the rest of my life uh, and so yeah it didn't really enthuse me the idea of uh, uh, doing a fourth year in it or trying to do a PhD or anything like that so I thought I'd work for a year in the corporate world. So I, I got into a graduate program with Accenture, worked there for a year. Uh, I had a horrible time. And so within a couple of months, I made an application for the master's program in Oxford so I could run screaming back into academia. Uh, and it was partly because I went, oh, I kind of always wanted to do this course. Uh, and then I sort of thought, well, I've only really experienced academia in one environment. So maybe it was just the people or whatever. Like, you know, maybe if I was in a different one, I'd try it out there. Um, and I thought the worst comes to worst, I'll have a year's course. If I decide I still don't want to do academia, I would have learned some interesting stuff. Big whoop. So, yeah. So I worked, uh, studied for three years, worked for a year, studied for a year, and then I worked day jobs since then. So so your master's at Oxford was the physics and philosophy. It was the philosophy Combo. of physics. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, physics. Yeah, jumping, jumping words around a lot. So technically, it was a philosophy master's strictly. So okay. I, it was kind of like a half theoretical physics, half talking about it. So we were doing a lot of lot of physics, but we were writing essays on it as opposed to solving like applied problems. And um, this was so we'd do stuff to do with uh, like you know black holes and time, uh, stuff to do with uh, relativity, this thing called the simultaneity convention. Uh, but then we also did some just like general philosophy outside of that. So yeah, I can go into all of that if you'd like. But that's what that was about. Yeah, I, I mean before we go into the nooks and crannies of it. Any stark differences between Oxford and Cambridge? Uh, so hard to say in the sense that I would, you know, it's different coming in as yeah. a graduate. Um, uh, I think there is a less self-defeating attitude with students at Oxford versus ones at Cambridge because at Oxford you have to do exams pretty much every term as opposed to every year. And so I think there's some sense of like, 
given there's more of them, they're slightly less serious, and they're sort of like, ah, okay, I just know I'm going to be tested immediately. This Feels like a, a progression. Kind of. This is, again, a very broad sense, very hard to summarize, and it's been a while since I was there, I was there like six years ago, so none of this might be true today. Uh, Oxford is more of a city um, than Cambridge is, and the university campuses are more spread out, so I think there's a sense of at least... Cambridge felt like such a bubble, at least at Oxford. Again, it sort of felt like there was like some touch with like the normal outside world as well. To what extent that's true for people there, I don't know. But it's it's pretty similar. Uh, you have colleges which all have different names, um, uh, and you know there were quirks and idiosyncrasies. There's I remember a friend of mine. His 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 like a really probably the oddest Cambridge convention. Actually, I'll, I'll give you two. I'll give you two. When I got matriculated into my college at Hamilton, uh, they don't do this anymore since COVID. Uh, matriculation basically means becoming accepted as a member into the college. The university organized, the college would say, organized this big dinner. And then they had this hollowed out tusk horn. They filled it up with wine. And they told us this sort of Latin phrase where one of us would have to say the Latin phrase, hand it off to the next person who would have to drink some wine from the tusk, say some other Latin phrase, and then like do the same thing, repeat through this line of people. And they'd all be topping it up. And they sort of said, yeah, you'll all get sick. But then you'll have fresh food and then you'll all be fine for the rest of the year. And I, I remember just like going through, I was like, well, what is it like this some sort of sort of satanic ritual? Um, what is it? You'll all get fresh as food. So sick as in, not hungover, sick as in. No, no, no. You're, yeah, because well, obviously everyone's like drinking from the same flask. <laughs> so they just call it one and of the... The staff were organizing this, to be very clear. This wasn't like some, some fraternity. <laughs> the, the, the head of like academics was like giving the speech and like, yeah, we're going to do this. We want you to get ill now so you don't get ill. They made the a joke about it. So they were clearly, I mean, like, yeah, they're, they're, they're aware of the germ theory of disease. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they don't do it anymore past COVID. They've got the horn in the bar though. Um, so that was probably, that was a moment where I remember just being like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm at this place. The other strangest ritual I've heard of is at this college called Merton. I have a friend who went there uh, and it's in Oxford. And uh, they sort of, Oxford's a bit weird because when you do exams, you have to wear this thing called subfusk, which is just like the academic gowns that they have there. And when the clocks went back, which they do, I think, in summer, uh, what they would say to all the students and merchants, you have to get up because the clocks go back at something like 3 a.m. Everyone has to gather in the court at 3 a.m. This is 100% true. In subfusk, and we have to walk around the court backwards, drinking port. This is a 100% <laughs> true thing that happens. I know this sounds like ridiculous. There's Google it. So, and it's like something to make sure the clocks go back or something like that. It's like a time-preserving ritual. This is something the, the faculty, the staff at Merton College organize. They hand the students port at 3 a.m. and demand they wear this warm academic attire and walk backwards around the college court. So, yeah, there were some weird things at these colleges. Yeah. I, I mean, I can get behind the drinking wine from the Tusk if it wasn't for the reason that it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, that's a pretty normal thing. To, it's kind of like fairly cool. normal. You're like, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, walking around the, the courtyard dark. backwards yeah. in the dark, drinking port yep. is very, very cool. Like, yeah, yep. So you know, uh, yeah. Okay. Different, different, oh, different. Well, welcome to Cambridge and Oxford. So, <laughs> uh, um, uh, sorry, repeat your question. What happened? You no, know? yeah, I was just going to then oh, go happens? into the the actual study itself. Study oh, itself. But before before you answer that though, where did the hardest exam in the world come into play? Yeah, so that was like that's an Oxford thing. So, okay. So one of the colleges at Oxford. Um, is one called All Souls. So um, All Souls College, so this is my most viewed video is basically me talking about an exam I didn't pass. It's really, really annoying. And I filmed that video the same afternoon I filmed a different video, which I thought would kill way more. <laughs> I can't even remember what that video was about. And I remember just being mortified. I was like, oh my God, why is everyone watching this? Anyway, All Souls College is a college in Oxford, which um, only has around 60 members. It's a graduate only. So you can't apply there when you first apply there for undergrad. And they accept about two people a year. And they accept people um, who uh, via this exam. And sometimes they don't accept any people, apparently. And so this exam sometimes we call the hardest exam in the world because of this really low acceptance rate and lots of people applying to it. It's not, by definition, the hardest. Uh, I don't think by any objective measure. But it's, it's, I'd say it seems tough. I tried it. I didn't do it. I don't know. Um, for that's worth. Um, it's humanities only. So there's no science or maths option. So basically, uh, you have to do... Um, two general papers and two subject papers and the subjects you have to choose from if I recall correctly it's something like this won't be exhaustive but it'll be <laughs> classics politics economics philosophy uh, history stuff like that and um, basically if you get into this college for accepted as a member they give you lots of funding like you get I think seven years worth of like accommodation and so on so it's, it's, it's worth worth your time 
um, to, to attend that college while studying what else, whatever else you're studying at Oxford. And obviously they have like this very rich network and all that. And the reason why it's a difficult exam is um, each of these papers, you have three hours and you have a list of about 20 questions to choose from and you've got to write uh, essays on three of them. So generally an hour per essay, so you write 12 essays in total. And the questions are very open-ended and they, there's no real mark scheme or anything like that. The kind is looking for you to be creative. And so the questions, I think, are the ones uh, I was on. Is, they ask something as open-ended like, you know, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, discuss. Uh, or, yeah, uh, or, um, you know, should we bring Willie Mammoth back from the dead? Or have streaming services been good for music? Or um, something like, uh, you know, define kafefe. Uh, or um, I remember one which is something like, uh, invent a new idiom and then spill the beans. So really open-ended questions. And all the subject-specific ones, they'll be, uh, you know, again, I can't write, I picked the philosophy papers, obviously, but it was stuff to do with, um, you know, they'll reference, like, they'll quote some academic and they'll be like, discuss, is this correct? This is justifiable. Um, there might be something like, you know, does scientific knowledge have limits? Uh, or um, was Kuhn ultimately right about science being driven, uh, like being a social enterprise? And so they'll assume some level of being well read and just, you just got to run with it. So um, the video I made was about that entire process. It was probably a little bit more succinct than I was just then. I did the exam when I applied to Oxford, when I, when I got accepted in, because I thought, why not? I'm here for kicks. Uh, I didn't get through to the next round. Uh, and one of the questions I answered was um, uh, around, it was something like, what if there were no hypothetical questions? Which I remember just thinking, no one else is going to do this. I'm going to try doing this. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that's all souls. <laughs> so, yeah. And you said in that video that you used the question, what if there were no hypothetical questions yeah. to prove that aliens exist? Yeah. So I, I, again, bear in mind, I did this, did this question after like 11 hours of exams, not all sequential. <laughs> Um, and it was, it's off the cuff, so I'm not necessarily like justifying this, but my argument was at the time, if I can recall it, was, um, there's two ways we can understand what hypothetical question means. There's the one that everyone's familiar with, which is like, if I had wings, uh, would my life be better? That's like a hypothetical question because it's assuming a circumstance that doesn't exist and then asking a question about it. But then there's also the kind of hypothetical question, which is say like, um, uh, the interviewer. I uh, like interview the president and he asked some questions, but hypothetically there would be questions that he could have asked that would have been better questions. Like there are questions which we don't know what they are, but they're hypothetical. So on the first one, if there were no hypothetical questions, and then, you know, that's only hypothetical because the circumstance doesn't exist yet. Right. So I don't have wings, which makes that a hypothetical question. Um, if, if there were no hypothetical questions, that means that somewhere I do have wings. So it means that there's like, like all possibilities have been realized somewhere, right? Um, uh, because nothing's a hypothetical. You know, if, if you said hypothetically, uh, if we were doing a podcast, um, I could ask you this question. I'd be like, it's not, we're not hypothetically doing, we are doing a podcast. It's not hypothetical. So if it's real, it's not hypothetical. That was my argument for that. So on the one hand, if there were no hypothetical questions, it would mean that all possibilities exist. The other version, which is, if there were no hypothetical questions, as in there were no questions that hadn't been asked, essentially, mm. what would happen if there were no questions that hadn't been asked? I basically said, well, I think this is like impossible because there are an infinite number of questions you can ask and like time is finite. Like how could you ask every question? And so I basically said, the only way this could happen is if like we, we as a human race haven't asked all the questions. If, but if there were no, if, if all the questions have been asked, someone else had to have done it, right? If okay. every question that could have been asked had been asked, we haven't done it has to be someone else, so it has to be aliens. That was uh, I thought the reasoning was from the first one that if there are no hypothetical questions, then all possibilities exist, so the possibility... So I suppose it's yeah, proven yeah, both, 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 both work, both work. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but specifically with the second one, I was like, well, if we're basically saying, you know, no questions are hypothetical because every question's been asked, we haven't done that, so someone else must have. Mm. And that's why aliens must exist. Okay. Very again, interesting. Not, I was trying to write something interesting in a short period of no, time. That, that, like, makes, that makes a whole lot of sense. So, that makes know, a whole lot of sense. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm glad I've been able to connect the dots. Yeah, well, <laughs> again, it was, I mean, it was, I don't know where they're going. leading or, I don't, I don't or, think or, they or what the conclusions <laughs> are. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but it's a great one because uh, where I really messed up in the essay is, of course, the question is itself a hypothetical question. And I think in re I should have mentioned it like this question wouldn't be hypothetical. Anyway, yeah. So. I messed that up, but you know, yeah, yeah, it was a good fun. I would say to anyone who's interested, if you Google All Souls College Oxford, past papers, um, 
they they have they show like past questions they've asked. They're really good at sort of late night chatting questions. Mm, like, they're the really thought. really great, and they spark such fun conversations. So and stuff like you know, is sex work the same as any other kind of work? Uh, you know, or um, you know, the Woolly Mammoth one's great. Uh, I'm trying to think of literally any others. Um, uh, oh, one I think I even mentioned that video, which was in my paper, was like, were ancient slave traders bad people? And it's like, well, in some sense, like, obviously, yes, slavery was horrible. But then it's like, well, are we judging them by the same standards we judge everyone else? Oh, if we do, is everyone a bad person? Is this is this our conclusion? Stuff like that. Which, again, you may want to conclude, but it's an interesting conversation. So, mm, Good food for thought if you want to potentially fall out with your friends. I, 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 oh, 100%. <laughs> I've got no one left. <laughs> so... Yeah. <laughs> So the degree, the masters itself at Oxford, um, the philosophy of physics. Yes. Kind of give me your your conclusion. Conclusion. <laughs> Conclusions uh, on that. I will say the, it was when I went. It was the highest intake of any year they had. They had seven people. <laughs> so it's the only philosophy of physics department in the UK. Uh, I conclusions. Uh, and, and sorry, sorry, just to give like a. a <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Just more yeah. just, just just to give a. A definition, if if you can, which I'm sure the answer is not really. But what is the philosophy of physics? Is it why physics exists? Yeah. So I'd say it's in that smaller subsection of the philosophy of science. So it's basically looking at questions within physics, seeing if we can improve physics, um, that sort of thing. Uh, so there are specific. Yeah. So I'd say it's, it's basically just like an umbrella term for a bunch of questions around our current understanding of physics, whether we can improve it, and such and so forth. Um, so there are some a classic philosophy of physics question which a lot of, I would say even has entered sort of popular culture would be you know um, how do we understand how do we explain the weirdness of quantum mechanics really so um, a common idea that's entered into pop culture heavily is this idea of multiverse uh, which comes from this guy named Hugh Everett um, who uh, wrote this paper called the many worlds explanation of uh, sorry it was the theory of universal wave function was what he called it first and in technical terms when you write down the rules of quantum physics you can write them down in like five or six postulates five or six rules and then everything else follows from that and he basically said we're just going to get rid of one of these which i don't really think is super important um called the collapse postulate uh, and he's just basically saying there is no such thing as wave function collapse every possibility exists so quantum physics is a statistical theory. It can't tell you what will happen. It tells you what might happen. It tells you on average what will happen. So quantum physics, if I measure the spin of an electron, it's either up or down, it will tell me half the time it'll be up, half the time it'll be down. But one particular electron, it can't tell me. Sometimes there'll be a, you'll do an experiment and it'll say the probability of this happening is 100%. So sometimes it'll give you certainties. Um, so an example of that would be? An example of that would be like if you have, uh, you can have like a particle in a potential well so basically, um, you might say it's a hundred percent chance of finding the particle somewhere in this space. Okay, you might say right. Yeah, and like the probabilities of it being outside of this place is zero. That's something like that. Um, uh, or uh, like in terms of like the amount of energy required to for a particle to go from one level to the other, that's going to be a set amount. So, um, so this does actually answer your first question. So I went into this masters heavily buying into the many worlds idea, which is basically saying the way we can explain the weirdness of quantum physics uh, and why it's statistical is that um, every outcome that could happen does happen somewhere. So if me and you were to do an experiment right now and measure the spin of an electron and we go spin up, there'll be some version of us which has measured it to be spin down. Um, and that's why in the theory they go it's 50 up, 50 down because there's some people who see up, some people who see down. Um, I left that degree being like, nah, you know what? Quantum physics is just broken. We need to wait for the next theory. <laughs> I was just like, you know what? After a certain point, there's just so many paradoxes. We just, we, just need that, we just need a better idea fundamentally. I checked out a little bit, which isn't the most romantic thing to do. <laughs> I, I nearly, I, I, you had to, in the master's, you had to write four papers. And I didn't write one of mine on quantum physics, even though I was fully intending to, because I went, I just, I can't buy into this idea anymore. So, yeah, um, I think that's probably the main conclusion. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can try to explain all of that a little bit better if you want. No, no, no. no so I'm just, I'm just, my, my brain's trying to catch up. So if quantum physics doesn't exist or isn't true, yeah. then not all possibilities exist. Yeah. So, so let me, let me rewind a little bit. So quantum physics, um, invented in the early 20th century, uh, is the physics of the very small, the very cold, or the very isolated. 
So it's used to describe particles like electrons and protons, uh, or it describes a lot of things, weird things that happen when things get to really cold temperatures. And isolated, um, if you isolate particles from everything else, then weird quantum effects can basically happen, really. Um, Why not when particles get very hot? Is that is there a particular reason for that? Actually, in, in fairness, yeah, ho, 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 there there are we have physics to describe when particles get really hot as well. Um, but the very cold, some of the very cold effects are really described by quantum physics, if that makes sense. Okay. So, um, but yeah, it does apply to it applies at all temperatures, but nuanced effects happen at uh, cold temperatures. But you're right. Yeah, maybe that's a bad way to explain. It. Thank you for picking a hole. No, no, no. No, 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 no it's good. No, I was like, I'm, asking, I'm asking the no, 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 stupid questions. No, 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 it's good. So it, it um, yeah. Also, temperature is a um, it, that, that that as a whole concept, it becomes like a bit funky when you've only got a few particles because and um, temperature and water, you're like, oh, it's how quickly all the molecules are agitating. But if you only have one particle, it's like, well, what's what's temperature? Mm. It's like, oh, that's suddenly that's harder to <laughs> talk about. Um, anyway, so so that's that. Uh, it was developed uh, over the course of the uh, 20th century um, by a bunch of different people. Um, uh, famous physicists, you know, Einstein had a big hand in it. Um, there's a famous photo of like all the greats. So Heisenberg, um, uh, uh, you know, he said Schopenhauer, he's a physicist, no one was getting on my name, uh, but De Broglie um, uh, and um, uh, sorry, I was just showing it, uh, De Broglie. Names are escaping me. Too many names. Sorry. But anyway, yeah. Um, uh, what, with the, within the, um, so I'm going to take a moment to reset. So I suddenly uh, run out of words. I'm going to take a drink. Um, <laughs> can you pass me the sparkling? Yeah, of course. Oh. Oh. All right. Explain quantum physics. Okay. Yeah. So this was basically used. So quantum physics came about. Um, the word quantum is because uh, quantum describes basically like a, a lump sum of energy. So what happened was, there was this problem in classical physics, which was looking at like something called, um, there was this thing called the ultraviolet catastrophe, which sounds like there was this like big nuclear meltdown. It was basically just a mass problem. Thank you so much. Uh, when you heat something, you know how like it goes like red hot and then it glows and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And like hotter and hotter, it will change the sort of colors. So classical physics couldn't really explain why that distribution of colors changed when something got hot. Uh, and I believe it was, it may not have been, it was like Schrodinger or Heisenberg, um, or one of them, but basically one of these foundational physicists uh, just decided for like a trick. He said, let's pretend that light can only occur in like specific amounts, right? Quantums, like certain frequencies. And they found if he did that, the mass worked perfectly and it predicted. And he went, that's really weird. If I assume like light is quantized, like quantums of light, suddenly everything starts to make sense. And then Einstein had this thing um, which he, he published this paper alongside lots of others called the photoelectric effect, which is basically if you shine light of a certain frequency on metal, electrons start popping off. Uh, but if, and that only happens at certain frequencies, like if the frequency is too low, it doesn't happen. And that was hard to explain in classical physics. So basically lots of these pieces of evidence came around of the idea that light was quantized, came in quanta. Uh, and then you had other things where like, Electrons could start behaving like waves. You get stuff like wave particle duality. So it's like a huge maelstrom of people going, what the hell is going on? That's quantum physics. Uh, and so to talk about like the many world stuff, the weird thing about quantum physics was it was a statistical theory of the universe. So every other theory of physics pretty much is deterministic, which is saying like, if I give this amount of energy to a um, cauldron of water, it will heat up by this amount every time definitively, deterministic. If this happens, then this will happen. Quantum physics goes, if this happens, sometimes this will happen, and sometimes this will happen. Uh, there's this famous quote from uh, Einstein who says, like, God does not play dice with the universe. He really hated it. He was like, there's gotta be something wrong here, something we're missing. There's no way probability is at the root of reality, but it seemed like it was, it seemed like it was. And for a while, there was this interpretation called the Copenhagen interpretation which was also called the shut up and calculate interpretation, which basically said, we're going to take all these quantum physics um, equations, statistical things, and uh, we're going to say, all right, when you're doing an experiment, it's all statistics. And until you get an observation, bam, certainty and reality. Because you asked me earlier, uh, or one of the things mentioned earlier was, you know, these weird quantum effects can happen. And sometimes people might hear about quantum teleportation or uh, entanglement, but, I don't know about you, but I don't see any like weird things happening day to day, right? And um, 
one of the ways of explaining that, sort of not really thinking about it was, well, I guess until you look at it, it's uncertain. And then when you look at it, it's certain and we're just not going to worry about that. And so that philosophically terrible, right? Uh, whoever it comes along and he basically says, I think I can fix it guys. We don't need any sort of weird, it's probability and then it's reality because that's really funky. What if it's just, it's all reality, but when a quantum thing happens, the universe sort of splits uh, and one outcome is realized in one world and one outcome is realized in another. So it's basically taking the math seriously. So if you think about it, when we talk about um, a coin toss being a probability of one half, heads or tails, again, philosophy of probability is the whole thing, but we're basically saying like, Half the time, it'll be this, and half the time, it'll be that. And that's, you know, if we, if we flipped a coin a thousand times, we'd expect roughly 500 times to be heads, 500 times to be tails. So it's basically just saying, all right, well, that's the same logic we use for statistics in the real world. What if we just had that sort of interpretation on quantum physics? And obviously, this is a really radical idea. Lots of people didn't like it, but it's become popular. Um, and that's what you see in a lot of sci-fi and like Marvel, where you go, oh, it's the multiverse. Because here's the thing, quantum, quote unquote, quantum things, happen all the time. So every time, a, so we look at the window, right? And you know, or if, you, if you're listening to this and you're near a piece of glass, uh, some light will be reflected and some light will pass through. For every single photon, uniquely, this is a quantum interaction. There is a probability that it passes through and there is a probability that it gets reflected. On mass, it might be that 10% bounce back, 90% pass through. But you can imagine for every single one, there is a universe for that universe where it goes through and it bounces back. There is a universe, if this is true, where these panes of glass are perfectly reflective for a few moments because every photon gets passed back and there'll be a universe where we can't see any reflection in it because every photon goes through. Incredibly unlikely, like astronomically, probability essentially zero. But if we take the multiverse interpretation in reality, it's going to happen somewhere. So, but obviously on, on average, it's going to look like a, just a regular piece of glass. So hopefully that gives a tiny bit more mm. color to the whole thing. Sorry for the, I mean, the no, that, that, that explanation might have explained it and I've just missed it. But what is the justification of the idea that there could be a multiverse, that there could be something outside of this it pocket solves, of it existence? It solves this collapse issue of like it's probability and then it's nothing. And you know when I said earlier that you can write quantum physics in like five or six pieces? Um, so I've seen it written five. One of the pieces is this collapse idea. You just take that out. And so there's this elegance where we can get all of quantum physics with one fewer assumption and it makes all the same predictions, arguably. So here's, but this is a pushback. Some people say, well, you can't test this, right? It's not scientific because how, usually with science, you're like, my theory is different. Um, let's test it. Let's see where it differs. How am I supposed to test if somewhere, if some version of us isn't seeing this, right? So this is where philosophy enters in. Right, because suddenly it's like harder, or and you might say, "What well, is it? Science? Is it not science?" Um, so yeah, it's very hard to prove. Now, David Deutsch, who I mentioned earlier, he's adamant that science isn't just about empirical proof; it's about explanations, and that it explains what's going on. He's like, it literally, logically follows why we see what we see. But you could also push back on that. So here's here's an interesting pushback, which is, so um, with this many worlds thing, um, anything. Uh, every possibility is realized. So, all right, let's take an example. So if I flipped a coin in front of you and I said, it's a 50, it's a regular coin, right? And we got heads. And you'd be like, okay. Let's say I flipped it again. We got heads. You'd be like, okay, well, one in four chance could happen. Let's say I got heads 20 more times. You might, like, Jack, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure this is a fair coin. That is stupidly unlikely. And if I flip heads another 20 times, you're like, there's no way this is a regular coin, right? Now, if the many worlds theory is true, there'll be some universe where that happens, right? There'll be some universe where the glass is perfectly reflective. It, but you can't disprove it. You can always be like, well, we're just in a weird universe, right? Mm. My theory's still right, right? Because obviously it could be the case that a regular coin flips heads 40 times in a row. That's got to happen somewhere, right? But you would be entirely justified saying to me, Jack, this is a dodgy coin, right? And then we come back to that earlier instance of like, well, at what point do you infer the likelihood of this being true or false? So another pushback against the many worlds ideas is like, you can't prove it and you can't disprove it. So why are we talking about it? So that's that's philosophy of physics, baby. <laughs> that's philosophy of physics. But it's a nice idea. And like David Deutsch's book, Fabric of Reality, he points out there are a lot of other like nice things that come from it. But mm. uh, yeah, again, I hope that was somewhat yeah. made sense. But. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm going to go away today and have a... <laughs> 
have a long think and uh, I'll meditate stuff on it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I really am trying to, trying to trying to be clear on this. So no, 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 no. It's, it's all um, no. You've been very helpful, very insightful. Um, so you finish the philosophy of physics at Oxford. Yes. What's the the next step in the life? Jack Lawrence. Honestly, I was uh, I was very depressed. Um, so I, I I applied to do their PhD program. I got in, but I, I struggled with funding. And I was sort of like I had friends who were doing PhDs already, and they were like, "Oh yeah, I'm really depressed." And I and I sort of thought to myself, "Well, I already have depression. <laughs> so if I do a PhD, I'll get double depression, and this is already pretty bad." And so, uh, and I sort of realized that I would be spending the next three four years of my life reading a document which, if I was lucky, ten people would read. And they probably all disagree with it. And so I sort of thought, ah, do I really want to do this? So even if I had the funding, I sort of like had hold up. So I sort of just, I just got a, I got a job at a, um, a company that made software for uh, uh, hospitals, basically. And it sort of started um, just sort of drifting a bit. And I had like a lot of like personal things going on. I started developing like an eating disorder. Uh, and I started sort of self-medicate with doing like just stupid amounts of exercise. Um, I was in a very, very toxic relationship which I'd got out by out of by that stage but I was, it just sort of left me a, as a husk um and like with a lot of personal questions to confront of like you know how I let things get this bad and so on uh, and so yeah it was sort of it was a, a bleak time but I it, it sort of the opposite of um having been you know, I'm gonna do this next it was really just like I'm just gonna exist like I I'm just gonna drift so I did for a little bit so and I can get into all of that if you'd like yeah yeah i suppose um where i was going with that is at what point did you start doing what you do now on the content creation side of things and why did you start doing it so uh for a big part of my life prior to making videos my main creative outlet was improvised comedy uh which you i know it's a shock given you know how funny this you know, <laughs> interview has been You're like yeah of course that makes so much sense of course it had to be some comedic background uh i started at cambridge I got involved with the troupe there. I became president of the Cambridge Impronauts. We took shows to Edinburgh Fringe. Uh, after I graduated, um, me and my friends, we started a troupe in London. And um, yeah, so that was a big part of my life. And the reason why I started making videos was basically because of COVID. I had bought, thanks so much, I would bought a decent camera to start filming our shows with. And obviously when COVID happened, in-person theater and in-person everything stopped. And I went, oh, you know, I'm such a creative snowflake. I need to do something with my time. So I decided, I think it was in 2021, 2020? No, I think it was 20, 2020, yeah. I decided I was going to make YouTube videos for a year. I would just say, make videos for a year. because so I knew that it takes a while to get good at anything. Um, so I just said, even no, come rain, come shine, I'll just try out stuff. And the last week of that experiment, I called it a year of bad art. Because I was like, this is going to be bad. I'm going to make some really, really bad videos by definition. And in the last week of that experiment, I had a, because I was playing around with TikTok and other platforms too, I had a TikTok video I stitched of Hank Green talking about the philosophy of time, which suddenly blew up. I had 100 followers and it ended up getting like 600,000 views, which for me was obviously a lot more than the 12 views that I've been getting, right? Um, and that, then I was suddenly like, oh, damn. Uh, and sort of just kept at it mainly with um, TikTok for a few years. So that's how that came about. Okay. And from the start, was the focus of the videos philosophy? No, no. I tried everything else. <laughs> Honestly, I tried comedy. I tried. I, I I tried playing around with formats that I like to watch because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, so I made a video essay, which uh, on uh, the film Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which I really love. Ironically, years later now, it suddenly popped off and it's got two hundred thousand views. Yeah, like three. Years. I, th I thought that was the video that. No, 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 no. For and that's your followers. No, for. for for, uh, on YouTube now, I think it's responsible for the majority of what I have. But for years, it had like it was had like a hundred views. So I don't know. Suddenly, it was like, oh, I guess people are searching for Ferris people. I don't know. But um, no, really, I did everything in my power not to talk about philosophy. And the stitch I did with Hank Green really was an off the cuff, like, oh yeah, I, I know a bit about that. I did it in like three takes. It was the least amount of effort of any video I'd spent on that entire year. It's like it's oh, sounds law, like isn't a... it? Or it's some kind of physical yeah, philosophical weird thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The one you least expect or the thing you don't think about. But yeah, I tried, I, mainly because uh, also I was trying to make videos to make people in my improv troupe laugh. So I was trying to just do like dumb sketches. 
um, under the standard book. I mean, I cringe. I've, I've hidden most of them now because they're so bad. They're so terrible. There's nothing worse than bad comedy, right? Because it's like sincere, but also just doesn't doesn't land. It made them laugh, I think. Uh, so, yeah. But uh, so, but the philosophy thing just suddenly I realized there was an appetite for it, and I suddenly went, oh yeah, philosophy of physics is pretty niche. There were only certain people in my course, uh, and another reason why I kept making videos about it was I made this this stitch with um, Hank Green talking about the difficulty of measurement in science of making a clock in the first instance and essentially the observation was that uh say you're trying to build a clock for the first time uh you ideally want something with some sort of regularly spaced interval um but the question is like how do you know that's regularly spaced unless you can time the distance between mm. the intervals and in order to do that you would need a clock so in order to build a good clock you already need a clock so how do you what and so that's the thing, and that's um, there's a really interesting book uh, which talks about this problem with thermometers, um, uh, which anyway, I, I got that idea from. Anyway, I, I made this video, but about it felt like 60% of the comments went, bro, just use a sundial, it's not that deep. And when, I, when the video was blowing up, I, I wasn't like at home, and I went to bed that night thinking, everyone on the internet thinks I'm stupid. Like, <laughs> no, they're, they're wrong, they're wrong. So the next day, I made about five videos going, no, 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 I'm right. You can't just use a sundial and this is why. And then there was some pushback to that. So that's kept making videos. And then, yeah, I just, I just kept at it. And then I went and started talking about not just philosophy of physics, but philosophy of science. And then from philosophy of science to just general philosophy. So that's how that happened. That's interesting though, because you're saying about you need a clock to time the regularly spaced beats. Yes. We've obviously got an internal clock within yeah. us because I can tell, I mean, I'm very rhythmically challenged, but I, even I can tell you clicking your fingers then was at regularly spaced beats. Right. That internal clock, is that something we're born with? Is that inherent? Or did we learn that from, from life, from, right. from clocks, from experiencing rhythm? I expect there, um, there's probably like a really good anthropological or evolutionary answer to this of like music connecting humans through culture. And mm. that maybe would be something like, selection bias of people who have had a better sense of rhythm got on better with people who had a better sense of rhythm like cooperation and so bred more I don't know uh, I think in terms of that the only thing I'd say like the sort of philosophy answer to that is like it may seem regularly spaced but how do, you, how do we know the, uh, you know cause I mean you're... you just keep dividing it down to you know the further you go down right but like so you might you know the, the class there are optical illusions there are definitely auditory illusions right and presuming oh, that's all very well me just sitting there and like you know doing that but, you know, will I lose a beat after a while? Say we're trying to measure time passing. I can't just sit there and do that all day. Um, and so ideally you want some mechanism that's outside of you uh, to do that. And so what are you going to do? You're going to use, say, water dropping from um, a fountain or like a pond. Well, how do we know it's going to drop the same amount all day? All oh, that sort of stuff. So it becomes this interesting challenge. And actually building clocks. Um, when we improved the technology of clocks, that was a big way we solved the the longitude problem. Do you know do you know the longitude problem? So uh, longitude is basically if you imagine like you've got the the globe and you can divide it into lines. Latitude is like how where you are between the north and south pole. Longitude is just like east to west. And so ships had this problem where it's really easy, or well, it's relatively straightforward to work out how north or south you are by the the arc the sun makes in the sky. So you imagine the extreme of this. If you're on the North Pole during summer, sun never sets. You're pretty sure you're on the North Pole. And if you're at the South Pole during um, North Pole summer, it is put total darkness, you know you're pretty far south. And obviously you're on, if you're on the equator, the sun's going to make that really lovely direct arc across the sky. Um, but say you're sailing along something like some sort of sea line close to the equator from east to west, how far have you traveled? That's really hard to tell. Um, uh, the longitude problem, they actually fixed this because clock technology got really good what they did was they would take two clocks and they, these clocks became robust enough to like not break when the ship swayed left to right they would take two clocks and they would um synchronize them at noon before they left port so they'd look up the sky when, when there were the, the sun's at the top of its arc be like noon 12 o'clock both start start sailing off one clock they would leave untouched and then as they would sail every day when the sun was at its peak in the sky they would readjust the other clock to be 12 o'clock and slowly, there would be a time difference between mm. them. And as that time difference would increase, they would know they would make progress on longitude. And you can have a really good estimate 
and how far you've gone, which is great if you're talking about like, again, in terms of like maps, when you do turn, how much rations are you using and all of that. So anyway, sorry, that was a total, total aside. But um, yeah, to answer your, your, your question of like, why do we have a sense of rhythm? Probably anthropology, probably some evolution. I don't know. It's probably useful for some reason like that. Um, but scientifically being assured that your device is reliable and not subject to like human whims is, is difficult. And that's, I mean, the science of like building reliable devices is a nightmare. So like, say, say I mean, like right now, if we were look, if we both have watches and our times were different, how would we check who had the right one? We'd look, we'd find another. We'd find another <laughs> clock, right. How do we know that one's right, dude? <laughs> We'd have to hope that was right. But that's the thing. It's like mass yeah. consensus, right? So, you yeah. say, so, you say, so if you're the first person building a clock, how the frick do you know if it's... And what if it's been running for a few days? Is it slow? How do you know? And so, you, so you, then you have to do these things. I'm like, okay, well, we're going to infer that, you know, the sun's like at its apex in the sky, so it's going to be 12 o'clock. And on that assumption, we're assuming that the Earth's orbit's consistent, like spins at the same rate. That's an assumption, which if you're first starting out, we haven't got satellites yet. Mm. I hope so. It feels that way, but it feels like a lot of things, you know? So anyway... So anyway, yeah, you get the idea. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a, it's a rabbit I, hole. Everything's yeah. a rabbit, rabbit yeah, hole, isn't it? This is again, this is my life. <laughs> this is my life, dude. Because I, <laughs> I was going to ask you then, explain to us why the the sundial isn't wrong. But I guess it's because the sundial itself is based on assumptions. It is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and also, there's other practical things like, well, if it's cloudy, well, shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like okay, um, but the sun, yeah, the sundials, um, uh, and that's going to you know, as anyone's seen a sundial knows that, you know, it's, you can accommodate its angle for um, the seasons and all of that. I mean, the, the, you, you are actually extremely correct in that you look at uh, stuff like Stonehenge or old uh, civilizations uh, where they built structures which were clearly based around seasons where, you know, at the summer solstice, the sun rises and it's directly in the gap between yeah. two stone structures. You know that show was on every night people had an extraordinary good sense of time and so it's kind of almost a cheeky question you're like well how do we know what time it was it's like well, people had nothing else to focus on um but uh yeah the sundial yeah, it's it's flawed because yeah again you are assuming like you know the sundial wouldn't tell you if the uh the earth suddenly slowed down in the spin and because we have really good clocks we know that the earth is slowing down in the spin so oh. Yeah. Really? Well, there you go. <laughs> we wouldn't know that. So, yeah, so well, the reason for that is, um, so we have a certain amount of angular momentum uh, and there's, there's wind on top of that. And you imagine that the mountains are like big sails. There's friction between those two. So the earth is actually slightly slow. Again, tiny, tiny amounts. Not like, not yeah, we yeah. never notice yeah. this sort of thing, but it, it's an effect that we can measure because we've got really freaking good clocks. The spin of the earth is slowing down because of well, the... Well, one of the reasons is because of the wind. Yeah, yeah. yeah the yeah, friction yeah. of the wind on the mountains. Friction of the wind on the mountains, yeah. And is that... Well, so we're opening up a whole other door now in terms of the history of the geography of the earth. Mountains are rising yeah. right over time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's exponentially... It's exponentially slowing down, right? Because the mountains are getting taller, creating more friction. I, I, I'm, well, so it's... The wind has also only got a finite amount of energy. So to, to impart and affect the Earth's momentum. So if we transferred all the momentum from the air to the Earth right now to try and slow it down, it wouldn't like be like the Earth stopped. The Earth's way right. too heavy, way heavier than the wind, for sure. Um, but also the wind is getting, the Earth as a whole is getting energy from the sun. So there's this like complex system. We're also losing energy. So there's this like huge complex array of factors. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, there's also another thing. There's also momentum of like the inner core. We've got a lot of metal at the center of the earth which makes us really heavy like we're heavier than mars because of like our makeup and so that affects it so there's a bunch of other stuff but it's uh, as i understand it it's speculated that the atmosphere is the primary driver for the earth very very fractionally slowing down okay. and we can measure that because we've got really awesome clocks so yeah anyway which is why the sundial people were wrong <laughs> <laughs> going back zooming back out to the content creation um, we were talking about this before we started filming. Yes. The sex and cash theory. The sex and cash theory, yes, by Hugh McLeod or Hugh McLeod. Um, uh, I heard about this through uh, his book. It's called Ignore Everybody and 39 Other Keys to Creativity. Um, I think you pronounce his name, Hugh McLeod. He was a sort of early um, dot com uh, sort of internet businessman, if you like. He had a, a really popular early blog called Gaping Void, 
Uh, he also sold wine. You've probably seen some of his art because he was a cartoonist and he sort of made a lot of sort of business-esque prints, which a lot of officers adopted and there's a lot of them still around. He's still, he's still active. But this book's really good. I would recommend it to everybody. Um, one of the points in it is this idea of the sex and cash theory. And he basically says that like, no matter how successful you become, you will, there will always be a pile of uh, activities you have to do to earn a living. So the book is obviously about creativity. And he says, look, there's this idea of like, as an artist, you'll get to do whatever you want and get paid to do it. He goes, no, you look at the most successful actors or musicians or artists in the world, they all have to kind of do gigs. They probably don't particularly like that, like, you know, have that they just do, they have to do to get by. And we all know that actors have, have probably got some film, which is a big cash cow. It's not necessarily an acting challenge, but then they'll go do some play, which financially you go, this doesn't make any sense, but that's the, that's the sex. So he said, this is a, something that you need to embrace because if you hold on to this fantasy that one day you'll be able to escape doing things you don't like, you're going to be really disappointed. But if you accept that's just a part of life, then you can kind of just get with it. And yeah, you want to improve, you want to have more sex um, and like, you know, um, and ideally sometimes you can get paid really good cash for the sex because there's always going to be a divide and just embrace that. So, yeah. Mm. What do you personally think is the correct proportion someone should aim for of sex and cash? Oh gosh, I think it'd be, uh, you, you, you need to do as much cash as you can to not worry about cash. Uh, uh this is, I think it would be a pri yeah, privileged answer to give, uh, otherwise, um, uh, and for some people it's all cash and so uh, if you're in a lucky enough position to you know uh, start thinking about that ratio then I think you're, 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 in, a, you're in a good position I think it becomes a deeper question of um, you know what do you, how do you want to spend your time here uh, um, what balance of risk do you want to do like you say okay well let's say if I spend I don't know 75% of my time doing really well paid gigs uh, only 25% of my time doing you know, the sex, like creative outlets, which, you know, may even cost me money, uh, or I could do half and half, make less money, but have more fun. I don't know. It's your life. Um, uh, I can't make that decision for you. Um, depends. Uh, each one is a bet either way. You could focus on making lots of cash, but tragedy could strike. And this, the assumption you're going to retire and spend lots of time having, having fun. Maybe, maybe that'll never come to pass. Equally, if you party about all the time, maybe you might wish that you made more cash. I, I just don't know. I don't know. Um, I think probably the best thing you can do is try and enjoy, find enjoyment in everything you do. That I think it probably helps anyone. Um, but yeah, I, I can't I can't give a, a meaning class. No, I don't think. Yeah, I think that's one of those that's down to the individual, down to personal temperament. Some people are going to just, some people are worriers. Mm. You, you can do all the anxiety management in the world. Some people are just going to worry more than others. Mm -hmm. They're going to worry about money more than others. Yeah. So they're going to have to prioritize a bit more cash if they really can't let go of that worry. Mm. Some people, they're going to be happy being, you know, the, the leaf in the wind, life taking them wherever they end up. And they're going to be able to, you know, have sex nine spends at a time <laughs> yeah. and then, you know, get, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes that works out, you know, sometimes yeah. that works out. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I, I don't think it's a one size fits all, um, each, each side carries risk. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, I think it's a good observation to say that there will, for the majority of people always be a combination of both. And I think his, the main point is making that the idea that you'll suddenly reach a day where you do anything you don't want to do is probably un unlikely. So. Yeah. What's the difference between physical and subjective time? What is subjective time? Uh, I, I think for me, physical time is uh, the objective um, time dimension, if you like. So it's the thing that um, as we experience passes moment to moment, regardless of whether we're conscious or not. Um, and then obviously subjective time is our experience within that. Um, physical time, it's really, according to our best physical theories right now, doesn't pass, um, it's static. Uh, so um, Einstein, his theory of relativity, which is our best theory of space and time right now, um, there's no such thing as like the present moment in it. Um, it's the block universe theory. So the future and past are set in Einstein's theory. Um, and what we're experiencing is kind of like movie frames going through it. So you obviously you watch a film, the frames or the ending of the film have already been set when you start it. Mm. You're just right, so it's completely that. deterministic. Einstein's theory is completely deterministic. So, And that's the best theory we've got. Of space and time right now. That is um, my best theory. It's the one which 
has the, the most predictions that have been, and it hasn't been falsified, basically. It's the most in keeping with our observations. So, um, so now, it could be that physical time, there is such thing as a present moment, and there's a philosophy of time, uh, or, or, or sorry, a study of metaphysics which looks into this, where they say, well, look, it's kind of really weird that our best physical theories don't seem to talk about this thing which seems palpably real to us, which is the present moment, right? Now is, now is moving, it seems. Why do we, you know, is this, is this all an illusion or, or is this actually something physical? And different people will give you different answers. Um, my best guess is that uh, the present moment is probably something that is, is an illusion. Uh, and it's just a, yeah, it's something that comes about because of maybe entropy or some sort of subject, like, you know, cocktail of chemicals in our brain. Um, so yeah, I would say subject to time is this, you know, sometimes you hear these spiritual people that go, um, time is an illusion. And I'm like, uh, I mean, it's not, but I think I sort of get what you, you might be saying with that in that, like the passage of time, but then you don't seem like the physics type. So I don't actually necessarily know if that's what you mean, but yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that's answered your question. Yeah. Well, I've got yeah. many follow-up so, yeah, questions go. <laughs> off the back of it. Um, it's funny because um, a podcast I love to listen to, a big podcast, uh, Chris Williamson's Modern Wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. He said on one of his podcasts that his audience apparently hates it when he talks about free will versus determinism. Uh -huh. And I don't understand why, because to me, it's very it's, important. It's the, it's the question, isn't it? So not that I can't understand why people would hate talking about it, because I suppose you just end up going around in circles and we don't have the answer. Yeah, I, I don't know how, to what extent he's already spoken about it at great length. Yeah, well, well that's it. it. I, 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 might be, I heard might be like Joe Rogan talking about vaccines. Exactly. Like, Stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talk about something else. <laughs> that's it. I mean, yeah, I've been listening to him for two, three years. Yeah. For the three years prior, he may have done <laughs> 300 oh, yeah, straight okay, episodes yeah, yeah, on yeah. free will versus determinism. But for whatever reason, I, I find it fascinating, even if other people don't. Um what so Einstein's theory of relativity yeah. is completely deterministic, 100%. yeah, and that's the best theory we have of space and time. Of space and time, uh, the uh, so our two best theories of physics are Einstein's relativity and quantum physics, and they describe very different places. This is like one of the big so the holy grail of physics, which everyone's searching for. Well, a lot of people are searching for is the unified theory. The, well, the quote unquote quantum theory of gravity. So Einstein's theory is all about gravity and time. Quantum physics, like I said, small, cold, isolated. When you try and put them together, yeah, they don't really mix. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. Like sort of paradox happen and yeah, like they describe, like quantum physics is statistical. It says this might happen. Einstein's theory is deterministic. It says this will happen. Like fundamentally, they are like different constructions uh, about how to, how to describe and predict things, right? But, but but they're focused on different realms. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that, but you want you ideally want something that incorporates both. Of them. Yeah. So one of the reasons why Stephen Hawking is so famous is because he found an environment where he could combine them. The edge of a black hole. Black holes are described by Einstein's relativity, and he basically um, used the edge of a black hole and used a bit of quantum physics to sort of explain why black holes eventually shrink. So that's partly why that's this is why this guy's a bit of a legend. He's done one of the relatively few pieces of work. Which has managed to marry, managed to marry them uh, in a meaningful way. Um, so, so I guess to, to take a step back, we have a bunch of, and this is this is if we're trying to do the collage of physics, we have a bunch of different theories that describe how the world works. Sometimes they overlap a little bit, sometimes they don't. In quantum physics, uh, here's another way of putting it: there are four, as far as we know right now, fundamental forces in the universe: the strong and weak nuclear forces, which basically govern like atoms. The electromagnetic force, which is sort of like most other things, and gravity. Gravity is described by Einstein. The other three are described by quantum physics. Can we get one which really nicely describes all of them? So in quantum physics, there's a lot of attempts to use to maybe say, well, maybe we can think of gravity as a particle. Maybe there's this thing called the graviton. Uh, and the reason why people want to incorporate them is because it's probably going to lead to new predictions and new insights and that stuff like that. But in terms of determinism, in the original depiction of quantum physics, the universe is indeterministic because we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe this photon's going to go through, maybe it's not. Whereas Einstein's universe is super deterministic. So which is it? It can't be both. It doesn't seem like it. So that's that's partly why, uh, in terms of like, you're like, what is physics's line on whether the universe is deterministic or not? Jury's kind of out. When we come back to our, what we talked about earlier with the multiverse thing, 
the multiverse is deterministic because everything that ha can happen does happen but it does happen it's guaranteed to happen like we can say all that sort of stuff so depending on how you interpret quantum physics you might go oh the universe is totally deterministic quantum physics is deterministic relativity is deterministic as hell right so this is why all these things suddenly come back to the fray um so yeah sorry i cut you off you were saying that's no no uh, it's it's interesting because i was watching your videos on determinism and free will and, yeah. and what's the one that's kind of in between um, um so so there's a view called compatibilism compatibilism which basically redefines what we mean by free so um so sort of the purest form of free will in philosophical terms is called the metaphysical libertarian who this is sort of like the old school um you're, you can ultimately, yes, you'll be ex affected by external things, but you are ultimately free to choose to do what you want. And you could have chosen otherwise. Fundamentally, you could have done something else. So if you choose to eat a fruit, like if you're apple or orange, choose orange, you really could have chosen the apple. Determinists goes, you are always going to choose the orange. There is literally no physical way you could have chosen the apple. The idea that we're going to blame you for not choosing the apple, it's, it's like blaming water for falling down. It couldn't have gone. It's literally impossible. A compatibilist says, um, well, let's redefine what we mean by free here. Um, if we're forcing an orange into your mouth, um, that's not a free choice because you as like your own agent aren't using your own powers to, to make this decision. You're not really free there. But if you chose the orange over the apple and there's like no one, like there's no gun pointed at your head making you pick orange, there's no one saying if you give our like you know giving you a huge incentive like I'll kidnap your family if you pick uh, if you um, pick apple. Um, then we say well yeah he couldn't have chosen otherwise in like a literal sense, but it was him as like an organism that chose this freely like all the all the drive came from him as a person so that was quote unquote free. So that's the sort of redefinition and it becomes more it comes if you're trying to do like laws and stuff. Um, or like think about literally, it's kind of generally closer to what we mean day by day. Like if I go, you freely chose to wear this outfit today. I'm basically saying no one forced you to chose this outfit today. You and your own brain did that. So yeah, that's the sort of in between view. Right, but then complete free will is you you lo complete free will is oh you actually lit so I guess this is why it's, it's sometimes annoying because it's kind of like a language game. Complete free will is um, the universe is deterministic. The future is unwritten. Right? We have this incredible power called free will. We can literally shape the outcome of the future. And we are choosing to write that story every day. Page is blank. We're the writers. You chose to, this piece of fruit to eat. It, you could have chosen something else and you didn't. That's on you. Determinism goes, the page is written. We're just reading it. We're just seeing it. Compatibilist goes, oh, the page is written. We're just reading it. But if the character does something just on their own, We'll kind of say that character was free because, like, they were doing it on their own. It was their choice. Right. You see what I mean? But in the overarching theme of it's it, it's deterministic. deterministic. Yeah, yeah. Right. So compatibilists are still deterministic, which is kind of annoying. But they sort of say, well, otherwise it becomes really hard to talk about things. And yeah. So arguably, it's not really a, a middle ground. It's just like a, a reshaping of determinism. Yeah. So. Okay. Because it's interesting because obviously people have this debate this you know the people go through this in their minds all the time regardless of whether they're defining it in their head as determinism versus free will because i used to have discussions with friends all the time you know you've always thought is is the you know is it set is, is destiny a thing is mm -hmm. is the future set can i change it how much agency do i have yeah of course yeah um and before because i you know i've i <laughs> to give you my background i um i i studied physics at AS level, got a D, and that's where my relationship with physics and maths ended. That's okay. So, you know what I mean? I was never thinking about, ne not never, but you know what I mean? I, well, yeah, I was never thinking about a question like that in, you know, applying it with physics and maths. It was all yeah. just well, everything else. Yeah. Um, it, there, was no, there was no mathematics behind it, no physics, no science behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, determinism was always the more spiritual choice. Interesting. That's how I always thought wow, about it. Wow, okay. Because people would say, There's oh, destiny, faith. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, people, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I, because I used to think as well, because, you know, I'm, I believe in God, I, I have faith, 
Um, I mean, to, to go in line with what I've said on this podcast before, I don't believe in God. I feel like I know God. That's my experience of this awesome. um, universe. And before I used to think, yes, okay, so destiny is completely mapped out. It's always going to be how it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Since changed my mind about that, okay. I feel different now. Um, but that's what I mean. That, that's, and, and my friends used to view me, oh, because you know, you're religious, because you're very spiritual. Of course, you believe in determinism because that's a, a very um, faith-based worldview, yeah. a very faith-based view of existence that you think there's destiny because a higher power has mapped it all out. Mm, mm. And obviously now watching your videos and having this discussion where people actually talk about free will versus determinism, determinism isn't based on faith, spirituality, no, a higher view, power. Right, yeah, it's a yeah, yeah. scientific view. Whereas before it was, oh, deterministic, that's very faith-based, spiritual, and free will is the you know rational scientific view because it, you know nothing's mapped out. We are, we're beings, we're all here by the coincidences of science, mm-hmm. and we decided to do this, we decided to do that. We're, we're biological organisms, however you want to frame it. But, but yeah, it seems like it's, <laughs> it's actually the opposite now when you have this conversation, this debate within the realm of physics and science. So just to kind of pinpoint down on it more why is Einstein, how has Einstein's theory which is deterministic yeah. been proven to be true so much so um, proven to be true yeah, it depends which I, I, even, even that statement is kind of like uh, can you you can you can fail to disprove something let's put it that way so the landmark experiment which pushed Einstein to the forefront was done by a guy called Eddington. And what he did was he photographed the uh, a solar eclipse. And um, basically Einstein's theory predicts that light is going to be bent by gravity in a, I think it's twice as more than it's bent by Newton's theory. Uh, that could be the other way around, but it's something like that. There's some difference there. And I think it was in 1914 um, or 1915, uh, no, it can't be that because he published it in 1915. So sometime in, in, that, in, in that decade, 1915 onwards, Eddington did this experiment where he took a pic photo, he compared a photo of the stars at night to the same stars, but during an eclipse. So basically the light would have had to pass around the sun, but you could see the stars because obviously during an eclipse you can, everything is, is dark. And the, the, the stars looked... So you imagine if you like have like a, a lens filter on when looking at the night sky and like, or like a fish lens and everything seems to become more spaced out. Gravity, according to Einstein's theory, should be doing that in a certain way. Uh, He took the photos and uh, the photos were in line with Einstein's predictions and not in line with Newton's. So something was like, whoa, here's this thing which Newton didn't predict, Einstein did, Einstein seems to be more right. Einstein's theory is also where we get E equals MC squared. So it explains all of chemistry uh, and like the nuclear power, um, why the sun works. It also predicted black holes, which we've now observed while they're there. It fixed, there was this weird um, problem with the orbit of, I want to say Neptune, or one of the planets of the solar system, where it didn't quite line up with what Newton did. And so people theorized that there had to be like another planet, which we hadn't detected yet, which was affecting its orbit. Um, whereas in Einstein's theory, its orbit is exactly as it is observed to be. So it suddenly fit in with a lot of things that we've seen. So I'd say that, insofar as something can be proven to be true, it just it matched up with everything else we've seen. And in the, I guess, over 100 years that the theory has existed, everything's been consistent with it. Like, everything. Uh, to the point where it predicts that time... So GPS, uh, Einstein's theory predicts that time runs at different rates in different places. So you can slow down time relative to something else if you move very quickly, or if you're under a lot of gravity, if you experience a lot of gravity. Um, so a quick way to think about this... Um, if you're uh, falling into a black hole, time goes slower and slower and slower for you. So if you were falling into a black hole, time for everyone else would be comparatively faster and you basically watch the universe speed up. This effect happens at a really small scale for satellites because they are further away from Earth's gravity, so they experience slightly less. And we account for it and we alter their clocks because we know that time will be running slightly differently for them. If we didn't do that, GPS wouldn't work. We do that, and GPS works. Um, so in like the most r- random things from chemistry, nuclear physics, GPS, astrophysics, 
Einstein's been right every single step of the way. So that's why that's why he's Einstein. Okay, right. So it's still there's hardly an ele- an element of physics, if not science, where Einstein's theory holding true doesn't make sense. Mm. So going back to what we were talking about near the start of this conversation, it goes back to inductive logic. His theory is right about this. It's right about this. So you might. So some people would say, yeah. Some people would say, well, he's been right about everything so far. Mm. We've seen time dying. Or this one, so. Some now others would say, so notably Karl Popper or David Deutsch, and there are lots of other voices as well, would say, no, it's a bit different than that. Um, in science, we don't try and prove theories. We try and disprove them. And so this is just the best one. We It's the most right so far or the least wrong. It's probably wrong somewhere, but it's less wrong than Newton. So it feels a mm. bit disingenuous to say, like, Newton was wrong about gravity. He was pretty good, you know? Like, we, we can use Newtonian physics to get to the moon. Like, it's pretty good. Um, but we'd say, like, Einstein was just less wrong than him, right? And there's probably, like, another version of which is, like, slightly less wrong. Um, whether we... Are we just fine with inductive logic? A lot of philosophers say there's definitely an element of induction that we did find it with. Uh, others would say, no, um, we're just saying it's not as wrong as others. And so... And we don't have any other better ideas. So that's the one we're, we're with so far take your pick different people mm. say different things so okay okay there's no i'm uh, sorry again it's a very philosophical philosopher answer but it's just true i'm trying try to represent here no 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 yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. no no i'm trying to give no. the, the fair balance no no account. it's exactly what i'm looking for yeah, yeah. so yeah if that yeah, makes yeah, sense yeah i'm trying to give the balance account so yeah yeah um there's definitely yeah so i mean like einstein's a theory would say it's like um gonna hold forever um uh and so that sense of like inductive logic definitely implies yeah for sure Moving on now, because, I mean, obviously, as we've kind of exemplified through this conversation, philosophy and physics are very much intertwined. Did we, did we can I, can I actually just say one thing on the free will thing? That I know yeah. you just, so I would say the only thing is, right now, I think the forefront of science and free will is in neuroscience. There's a book that came out this year, I think literally called Determinism, by a guy called Robert Sapolsky, who's a neuroscientist. Oh, yeah, I've heard um, uh, So biology now is sort of like entering into the fray. But you can imagine how... Um, uh, you know, the, the, I guess there is a belief ultimately within physicists and a lot of people that ultimately the rules of how everything is governed. We're made of atoms. We're made of stuff. Those stuff are based on the laws of physics. If the laws of physics are deterministic, so must we be, mm. right? So that's kind of where those things naturally fall. And just from the religious point of that being, it being spiritual to believe in fate, I kind of see where that comes from because, you know, even the ancient Greeks, they believed in the fates, like the literal gods of fate. Um, and I think there's like this nice old version of fate that you see in Greek tragedies where it's kind of like your end point is defined. You're going to end up this way. If you run from it, you'll run towards it. If you run towards it, you run towards it. Like you get a bit of leeway in how you get there, but like your, your fate is mm. decided. So yeah, I think that's actually, now that you've mentioned that, I think that's actually a natural connection that I had to consider the spiritual belief and, and um Determinism, but yeah, sorry, you you want to? Uh, no, no. I just no, want to sorry. basically make yeah. F- physics. Yeah, while they do talk about determinism for sure, I think the forefront of the science determinism argument right now is in neuroscience. I just wanted to basically make that point. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I was going to say moving more over to philosophy, even though what we've yeah, been talking about all the time yeah, yeah, yeah. is, is course, philosophy. Course, course, um, is traditional Western philosophy always going to lead to the concept of God? Maybe my understanding of Western Gosh. philosophy is um, not a holistic one, but from my point of view, all the big Western philosophers um, over the past few hundred years, they all have this relationship with God or they all talk about God. It's all very... It all seems to end uh, point towards a higher power. You know, we talk about figures like Dostoevsky, Nietzsche. What's your view on that? Gosh. Um <sighs> To what extent that's a sample bias, I don't know. So here's, this, I think this is another version of like people going, well, like all the great scientists believe in God. It's like, well, but like everyone believes in God. So like, yeah, you know, like being an atheist and if they were closet atheists, they were closet because, you know, you, you couldn't really, that wasn't socially acceptable. Um, I think God is a really natural idea to wrestle with if you are thinking about the wider world and you believe in it and everyone else around you does. Do they all believe in God? I don't know. Like Nietzsche called himself the Antichrist. I... Uh, and then you claim God is dead. 
I say it's a bit strange, isn't it? It's almost sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But it's almost like the Jordan Peterson thing that Jordan Peterson doesn't say he believes in God, and yet his whole uh, kind of he tries uh, to act as though God exists. I believe, yes, so yeah, the yeah. Line of seeing say on it, like his playbook to on how to live the best life is a, <laughs> an incredibly religious one. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think God. I think I've, I've seen his interview with Alex O'Connor. I think he basically he doesn't like the question because he says the reasonable answer he gave was doesn't want to be pigeonholed into a certain camp, and the other one I think it's a, it's almost a rejection of this western philosophical idea so i would say philosophy in the west you can divide up into two camps you've got analytic philosophy which is very propositional based on statements proof logic and then you've got continental philosophy where you've got more like nietzsche in there or schopenhauer or kierkegaard where they're sort of more artsy talking about life uh you know the will to power that sort of stuff and i think peterson falls more into the continental philosophy camp um and it's, it's fun to talk about and think about for sure um where does it all point to God? I think analytic philosophy, sometimes it deals with God in terms of like truth and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, there's certainly overlap. I mean, God's, it's a natural thing uh, to, to think about. Does it always point to a higher power? I mean, there have certainly been atheist philosophers out there. Um, uh, yeah, again, I think it's, it's probably more of a historical question to say um, how many of them back in the day spoke about God because it was just like, there but a lot of them were like closeted about it so there's um a mathematician called kurt godel it's not a philosopher but he once wrote down he was trying to prove mathematically that god existed and he was by all accounts not a religious person but it was hidden it was only discovered after his death so i think yeah it's a natural thing for a lot of thing people to think about um yeah does i, I think but it would be remiss of me to say yeah it always it always points to god because uh, lots of people would disagree on that so which five philosophers, and I'll leave that over up to your interpretation. I was obviously thinking traditional, more like Western philosophers. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Which five philosophers are you inviting to your dinner party? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Past or present? Oh, gosh. Um, it's really hard. I really, if, the, if they existed, I'd really like to meet Latsu, who's the founder of, uh, arguably, the person who existed who founded Taoism. Uh, either him or um, uh, I can't I'm butchering the Chinese pronunciation or, or Changzi. Um, uh, they yeah they seem they're foundational to a lot of Chinese culture. Really interesting. Very different from Western analytic philosophy. So they would be a cool guest to have. Uh, I think probably an obvious one would be. So I'm I'm counting out as one. It'd be one of those two. Um, another one obvious would be. Uh, either Socrates, Plato, or Aristotle, um, between them, sort of like the founders of like the Western canon. Um, um, maybe I'll pick more than one. Um, so they'd be there. Uh, gosh, who else? <sighs> right, let's balance this out. So we've got, um, we've got some Chinese philosophy in there. Do I want Confucius? I don't know. <sighs> maybe I should have some theology. Because I think if I, if I want a table, assuming they'd all talk to each other, I'd want like a really wide range of views uh, uh, J.S. Mill, political philosophy, that'd be really cool. And then, oh, these are all going to be blokes. This is really terrible. Um, well, I mean, in yeah, fairness, so. because of the the course of history, ninety yeah, 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 yeah. percent yeah, aren't yeah. going to be. Yeah, I know, I know, but still, it's it's, it's bad. Um, and then, yeah, I probably I probably like Aquinas or something like that. Probably some theologian, um, and just like watch them scuffle about. That'd be really interesting. So I guess if I was going for a more science based table yeah i'd probably take Lazzi, um aristotle karl popper um actually no screw screw aquinas for taking descartes uh and then uh uh js mill js mill then i'd take those i think that would just be fun those are lots of people i would like to speak mm. to that'd be a um, hell sure. of a party yeah. yeah 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 it would be they'd hate each other <laughs> Lazzi would be chilling he'd be chill <laughs> don't know about the rest of them so js mill and karl popper would probably get on don't know about aristotle yeah, actually, yeah, I think some of it would be okay. Yeah, actually, I think you want okay. you want an appropriate degree of tension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, be interesting because Descartes, Descartes was Descartes' philosophy was really great. Like his um his like I think therefore I am his uh I again I um, think it's called Cogito Ergo Sum um but it's worth looking up. Like it's written really accessibly, even though it was written hundreds of years ago. It's literally him. He starts off going. So I've had these. He's basically it's a bit more verbose, but he goes almost almost like this. He goes. So I'm sitting down, writing my journal. I've had these thoughts for a while and just thought I should get them down. And 
I've been really thinking, like, how do I know I'm here? Like, it's really written like that. It's really like like a diary entry in that sort of way. It's super accessible. It's really great. So, yeah. What are your top three philosophies for navigating life? Oh, gosh. I would say, I wouldn't say these, um, uh, ooh. I would say embrace the steel man. That'd be number one. So uh, can you effectively articulate the opposing view to whatever you hold or, or an opposing view? It's not always just two sides to every story, obviously. Um, I think that's super important uh, for a variety of reasons, for making sure to try and avoid bias, for one, um, but also to strengthen your own argument. If you have the truth, the criticism will only improve it. So I guess that comes from the tradition of criticism. Um, and you shouldn't be afraid of criticism. In fact, if you want to seek the truth, maybe you don't, but if you do, that is a natural thing to, um, to lean into. So number one, embrace the steel man, which I guess really is just embracing this tra uh, traditional criticism within that. Uh, second one, <sighs> say, say almost like, it's almost like a, a line from Nietzsche which is, he says something, again, I'm going to try and I'll probably butcher this quote, but he says something like, uh, thoughts are always the shadows of emotions, like, uh, whereas, uh, like, more of, I think emotions are richer, uh, deeper, and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of Nietzsche's work was around basically saying, your philosophies of cope, you're trying to rationalize your ill will towards, and, you know, this was this whole slave morality, master morality type stuff. I think he does have a point for a lot of things. I think we are really good at rationalizing our feelings and we're, and we're trying to think of like, oh, well, you know, the world's this way, so I feel that way about it. It's like, I don't think that's the causal order of things. I think it's probably the other way around. And again, if you value truth or self-knowledge, I would really look into that. I'm like, okay, well, what came first, your feelings or your intellectual conviction? Uh, I think that's, he's, he's, a, he's really compelling as a... The, the philosopher of the hammer, I guess, because of that. And he does, he, he, he does really like um, uh, poke at you that way. So that point, and then I guess the third one is kind of um, probably a line from Epictetus, uh, um, which is again, like another really great one, uh, which is, so the first one, I guess, first one's about learning. Second one's kind of about learning. I guess this third one like kind of completes because it's more about living, but it's um, uh, if someone were to observe you and not hear any, anything you say, uh, how would they describe your views? Like, you know, you may profess to be a Stoic or a Christian or, I don't know, a Buddhist or whatever, but, like, do you act that way? Are your actions in alignment with your views? I think that's just like, so cutting because I never live up to that. Whenever I hear that, I'm like, oh, God, he's right. What a piece of shit. I'm not sure you can swear on this. Sorry. <laughs> no, gonna, no, 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 no. Uh, oh, no. Uh, but there's been plenty. Of uh, I'm, so, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, like, it's such a good, it's such a good question. And he said this to his Stoic students. He's like, you guys are all really good at talking about Stoics, but Stoicism, but you live like hedonists. And I'm like, damn, I really do live like hedonists a lot of the time. Um, so I think that's good because, yeah, it, it prevents that sort of like holier than thou uh, type thing. Um, and, if you're, and if your actions aren't in alignment with rhetoric, your rhetoric, I think that nicely goes back to that second point of like, well, okay, what's really driving your behavior? Um, so yeah, I think for living, I would say those two. You mentioned a couple of times about seeking truth. Mm -hmm. Do you think everyone should seek the truth? Uh, yeah, I think, to repeat, I don't think anyone should listen to anything I say, um, or I'm not sure anyone, sh everyone should do anything. I personally am fascinated by the truth. Uh, when, I think in one of my interviews, I said something like, for university, I said something like, um, you know, it seems like I'm in, I'm in this game of life. I want to know the rules. So the laws of physics feel like, the rules it's worthwhile doing that um uh, i also think the idea that there is a truth is the best explanation for everything else so some people don't think the object an objective reality exists they think you know it's all subjective i think that's a hard i think that's a really hard viewpoint to get behind for a variety of reasons but you know we, we can discuss that so should people seek the truth uh i think you're gonna have I think the right amount of it, or at least some of it, is going to be beneficial for anything else you seek. So say you want to be happy. 
knowing the truth about what makes you happy or what makes you unhappy is useful for that. So you want to be rich, knowing the truth about how to make money or what drives people is going to be useful for that. So you want to, you know, have a connection to God if you believe in such a thing. I think by definition, to be religious, you have to be obsessed with truth because you have, you, if for most people, if it's a theistic religion, you're saying, well, this reality isn't all there is. There's something else out there. I mean, that's a huge thing. I mean, you've got to be, to take that leap, or maybe you'd say it's not a leap, maybe it's a natural inference, but to, to hold that view, you're not going to hold, you, know, it's, it's, you must be obsessed with truth. Because you're not going to, you know, I don't think anyone says, oh, I believe in this, but it's not true. You're like, this is the, the truth. This is the absolute truth. So I think for me, and, and, and there's, I think there's such a thing as too much truth, and we can get into that. Um, and I think I mentioned that at the beginning of this podcast, but yeah, I think for a lot of people, it's a worthwhile endeavor. And uh, you know, reality is stranger than fiction, that's for sure. So Too much truth. Too much truth, yeah. Well, so let's put it this way. Um, again, and, and then this comes down to like definitions, but um, you and I were very finite beings. There's only so much we can think about or comprehend at one moment in time. Um, you hear people nowadays having an information diet and you know, just be cultivating ignorance of certain things. I would say this is kind of like what I mean when I say you can have too much truth. Knowledge can be a burden and there's only so much we can take. Um, so uh, there are truths which I think can like um, make people upset. And this is when we, we, the, the other example of like think, thinking you're attractive above average attractiveness when maybe you're not, but maybe believing that you are um, being uh, helpful in that. Uh, yeah, I think there's a time and a place for depending on your emotional disposition. And I don't really think you can calculate this. So it's kind of like a weird thing to say, but remaining ignorant of certain things might benefit you given the other things you want to do in life. Like if your goal in life isn't absolute truth, and I don't think really for anyone it is, I think truth is a means to an end. Um, knowing the truth about absolutely everything in every capacity probably isn't um, isn't useful. Here's another, okay, well, here's a, maybe a more concrete example, right? Uh, marriage, uh, imagine a happy marriage. Maybe for some of you that's hard to imagine. I don't know. Um, but you imagine, uh, would you want to know the truth around like how many times your partner maybe thought about someone else sexually if you're in a monogamous marriage? Like, is that useful? I don't know. Is more truth better? I don't know. You probably imagine it happens sometimes. Now, if you knew, and if you, uh, let's say they've never been unfaithful and they just think about it. Is that going to, is that, do we want to go down that road if they're never going to be unfaithful? I don't know. Now you might say, I need to know because maybe they'll be unfaithful. You know, it's a whole thing. I think there are certain things where it pays to not know. Um, and becoming obsessed with knowing can be its its own its own uh, compulsion. So, yeah, again, I'm not sure if that's a satisfying answer. But that's... No, it absolutely is. I think when we talk about we want to know the truth in like a, an existential overarching sense, we're talking about the roots of, of things, right? We're talking about what we've talked about here today, you, how things work, the why. Free will, know. all that sort of stuff. Yeah, why that, that thing. What's going on? Yeah. What we, the fuck? <laughs> That's a, that big extra question. What the fuck? Yeah. We don't necessarily mean, no, like truth and knowledge aren't necessarily the same thing in that context, in the sense that whilst we may want to know the truth, like the over, I guess the, the example would be, to go back to, you know, you want to know how many times your wife's thought about sleeping with another man. Yeah. Um, really, when we say, oh, we want the truth, we want to know, is she happy and satisfied right. in That's the, the marriage? Yeah. And then if we were to say, we want to know everything mm -hmm. in terms of knowledge, it would be, we want to know how many times she's actually thought about sleeping with someone yeah, else. Yeah. I think that, again, I, I'll see if I can dig out a citation on this, but I think there was a paper done on people who have, like, well, stupidly good memories. And they, you know, they'll remember anything anyone's ever said to them. And I think there was this harrowing thing of, on average, they seem to be less happy because we have a negativity bias uh, with, we remember worse things better than we remember positive things. And they struggle with trusting people because they'll remember every time really well and not forget where someone said something. They're not nice or something like that. And that's kind of a weird thing to think about, right? Of like so much of our happiness might be predicated on forgetting or, you know, um, putting on rose-tinted glasses for certain things. So, 
Yeah. Um, is, is that quote unquote proven that we have a negativity bias? We tend to th- remember negative things more than positive. Uh, we definitely have, um, I think it's pretty well documented in psychological research that for if you lose five pounds, that will make you feel as bad as gaining 10 pounds will make you feel good. So we feel bad things twice as much, at least with monetary losses. There's definitely a paper like that. Um, I think it's also the case that, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely like a bunch of different areas where um, people are prone on average, big on average, big asterisk here, to focus more on negative things that have happened than positive things. You see this again, other anecdotes, uh, creators or someone does a great performance, five star reviews, someone gives them a one star review, they're like, oh, I'm so miserable. And you go, what? You got like eight five star reviews. Oh, but this one is really, that's negativity bias. We focus on negative. I do think that's a general thing. And there's obviously good reasons for that. Focus on problems. That's the things that need your attention. Da, 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 da. But yeah, I think uh, to what extent that applies to like everything in every situation, I don't know. But I think when it comes to like emotional things, yeah, I think I'm fairly confident saying there's literature that supports that. Okay, for most people. Mm. So, What can philosophy or even physics for that matter teach us about death, mortality, and even grief? Oh, gosh. Probably more than I could teach you. Um, <laughs> uh, philosophy, physics, death, mortality, and grief. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, I can't recall the name, didn't tell everyone the today, but, uh, I remember one philosopher I went to see when I was like 17, um, with a friend said that all philosophy is just trying to prepare for death. It's just trying to rationalize that. Um, uh, and you know, obviously a large amount of literature is dedicated to it, you know, the unexplored continent. Um, so Obviously, some philosophy will tell you what happens after death. Some will say there's a lot of skepticism if there is anything. Uh, I think what physics can tell me, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you this, which I've taken from physics, which is if Einstein's theory is true, or at least if this part of it is true, that the future and past are written uh, and they exist, there's this, and, they're, and they're as real as the present moment, then all of your best memories and worst, but all of your best memories, all of that, that's kind of permanent and indestructible. It kind of permanently exists. Um, I don't think this is some, I don't think this is, and I, I think about this more in terms of like grief and for people who have passed, but I'm like, if, if, if Einstein is right, then that frame of the movie, is just there, just cause I'm not seeing it, it's still there, you know? Um, uh, and, and that gives me a tiny bit of comfort because I think, the idea that they exist on some level, if not just in my memory, but like physically, objectively, that's real. That's part of the fabric of everything. That for me is a comforting thought. Of course, could be that Einstein's theory gets disproved and we find out that's not true at all. Um, but so far, our best evidence, our best theories seem to suggest that, that um, while we can't access it necessarily uh, in the present moment, that, that, that stuff exists. So um, with physics, you might say, I, I think the obvious answer here, here would be that, you know, energy and matter, matter is never destroyed. It just gets converted into energy and back and forth. So there's sort of a, um, a permanence, whether you like it or not, to all of us and what we're manufactured with. And I think Neil deGrasse Tyson speaks very movingly about the sort of poetry of all the elements that we're composed of, you know, came from stars and, you know, we're part of this big cosmic, cosmic symphony. And I know lots of people, whether on mushrooms or, you know, on, on, on something else, on faith, on prayer, some really good prayer, uh, feel some deep connection to the universe through that way. There's a, a quote from, again, I want to say, uh, Heisenberg, um, and I, no, I think it was Schrodinger. He said that the first gulp of natural sciences will turn you into an atheist, but at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. Mm, oh, so that's it's a, a really, it's yeah, a, it's that's a, a really good it's quote. A, it's, a, it's a banger. Um, uh, 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 I'm pretty sure it's, Schrodinger, I'll, I'll double check that for you. And there, there are a lot of physicists who they'll lose their faith and they'll study so much they'll find it again because they'll just find this deep elegance and all that. Um, so what can it teach us? Everything and nothing. Uh, I'd say the things I'm most certain of are, yeah, uh, I, if I had to put my money, I'd bet that there is some permanence to all moments. Um, energy and matter, E equals MC squared, that sort of stuff. I think that's probably gonna last. And um, but also we can be certain in our uncertainty. We, we certainly don't know what happens next, if there is a next. And um, 
probably that took to some extent that should inform our decisions and our conduct here. But beyond that, I'm just as clueless as everybody else. So Poetry is, I mean, some people might contest this, but uh, this is something me and uh, a good friend always say, that the best poetry is birth from sadness. You know, the most beautiful music is often Ah, time. tragedies. I'm just going to check this. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, sadness can be such a powerful catalyst for art. Maybe the most cat- uh, most powerful catalyst for art of any kind. Yeah. The greatest Western philosophers, the continental philosophers, as, as yeah. we're talking about, yeah. had brutally challenging lives when you think about people like Dostoevsky. Um, on the premise, uh, as we were just talking about, that people want to seek truth or even should seek truth. Should we aim for, quote-unquote, the most challenging life possible? Should we even seek sadness? Gosh. Um, So I think the... Given your question, the thrust of it is, you know, if you wanted to be the best philosopher you wanted to be, you could be... You have a really sad life. And Mm. boy, your philosophy (laughs) is going to be on point. I think there is a line, I think... I think there was a line, I think a truth to Socrates or Plato was something like, if you want to be a philosopher, like have an unhappy marriage or something like that. Like really, because Socrates' wife famously hated him uh, and said like, you're a bum and you're not bringing any money in or something like that. Like, yeah. And he was Socrates. <laughs> so, you know, do I say that was causal? I don't know. Um, uh, certainly I know for a vast majority of people, if you have a terrible relationship, it makes you think. So uh, should we seek challenge? Uh, again, I think it's very hard for me to tell people what they should do. Uh, I'd say challenge is going to probably sneak up on you regardless uh, if you stick around long enough tragedy is uh, on everyone's cards Um, so I don't really think you have a choice really Uh, I think there is this it certainly seems to draw stuff from people more than maybe like good times do Um, but I don't think I think it's a necessity in some sense I want to be like life's hard enough and we dedicate a lot of time to alleviating suffering so it seems like very paradoxical to sort of go well we've spent all that time eradicating disease and war but we should go and be... contract the plague yeah go be go be miserable um I mean yeah the Stokes would do this they'd like uh, they'd uh, fast and stuff like that to like you know self-impose challenges and stuff like that I think there's a very big difference between challenge which is voluntarily undertaken because you want to find something within yourself and challenge which is thrust upon you which by definition none of us get a choice of um the, i think let's put it this way uh, uh Lao Tzu, who i mentioned earlier or lousy or however you want to pronounce it the arguable founder of Taoism, or you would say he didn't found it, he just gave it a name there's a painting it's very famous called the vinegar tasters have you heard of this it is. no i haven't it's vinegar tasters it's, uh, it, it depicts uh Lao Tzu, the buddha confucius uh over a vat of vinegar and they've all they've all got their fingers in their mouth. The premise being they've just stuck their fingers in the vinegar and they are, 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 are tasting it. And the expression of Confucius, who founded Confucianism, very influential in Japanese culture particularly, but also Chinese, uh, his expe- his expression is bitter because you know pure vinegars, it's vinegars, it's, it's unbalanced, it's, it's it's you know it's uncouth, uh, you know, um, and uh, a balanced dish should it shouldn't just be vinegar. And then you, you look at the, the Buddha's expression and his, his face is a bit sour as well. And that's because, you know, life is suffering and, you know, and it's, it's an illusion. And we need to transcend this and become enlightened and, and not become attached. And Lao Tzu is smiling. And it's very different interpretations, but, you know, uh, vinegar is just another facet of the world. It's perfectly what it is. There's nothing, it doesn't need to be changed. It is, he embraces it, embraces the experience. And one of the things I really like about traditional Chinese medicine is... Uh, they've got this five element theory where they they, they, they link it in with tastes and emotions but they've got uh, fire which is joy earth which is often translated as thought or love uh, metal which is sadness uh, water which is fear and uh, wood which is anger and what I really like about that is there's no sense that any of those are bad or good it's just a part of the whole it's all part of the cycle one leads to the other um, so I would say is there value in being sadness? absolutely and there's value in every facet of the human experience. And it's not on me to tell you what to do, but if you haven't experienced challenge, then maybe it's worth undertaking it, if only for curiosity. 
sadness is going to come at you one way or another but yeah I, I I like that view of there's no experience which is inherently bad or good it's up to you what you want to experience um, and how you want to live your life and hopefully you have the means to do that um, but I like that picture of Lao Tzu over the vinegar tasters where he's smiling he's like it's just another part of, it's another part of life let's lean into it we're, we're lucky to be here so I'm going to ask you a, a, qu and a question that I have noted down, which is a complete aside before I Shoot. ask you point blank the two big existential questions to finish. Um, how does somebody do chin-ups with 45 kilos? I was watching that video of you. It, oh. it, was, a, it was a good video of you in the gym uh, doing certain exercises and it was a bit of a comedic sketch, you pairing it with different Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. Probably doing chin-ups with uh, 45 kilos on the belt is, is very impressive. Give me the... I can't principle. do anything else. Uh, <laughs> literally, I squat. My squat's terrible. I, I can't I can't bench. I just have bird bones. I don't weigh anything. I, I, I honestly... I, the genetics. I, I've trained them like I would train any other exercise. Progressive overload. Um, slowly adding weight. Probably training in the, um, you know, five to, eight, five to eight rep range for a long time. Um, I got really into calisthenics when I was, like, in my early 20s and wanted to try and get the one-arm chin up. Um, and so... Yeah, it's just a lot of weighted chin-ups, but I, I, tra I, I treat it like any other lift. So I, I train it um, in some form, twice a week I train weighted um, chin-ups and weighted pull-ups, both once a week. So pull-ups being a supinated grip, your hands facing or pointed away from you. Chin-ups when you're, uh, um, sorry, pronated grip, when your yeah. hands pointed away from you, supinated when your hands pointed towards you for the chin-up. Um, yeah, just twice a week, a few sets, progressively overload. I trained it in the same way I've trained every other thing. I'm just really good at that. <laughs> I literally, I wish I could give you some secret recipes. Literally that. As, as with everything, so, no yeah. secret sauce. No, no secret sauce. Bit more volume on them. I've squatted the same weight for like eight years. It's really annoying. And I, I try everything. I can squat like four times a week and try squat. It doesn't change. It's really freaking annoying. <laughs> so, yeah. I, um, so. Final two questions. Like I said, big existential ones. Shoot, 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 shoot. You said near the start of the conversation that when you were 14, 15 and you first got interested in philosophy, physics, you, um, I can't remember how exactly you put it, but you were an atheist. Yeah, I went through an edgy atheist phase. That's it, edgy sure. atheist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think you said, um, I don't quite hold that view anymore. I've softened a little bit, yeah, yeah. Do you believe in God? And what is God? Uh, I would say I, I'm, I'm not sure if anything like God exists. I would call myself an agnostic or... Some people would say agnostic atheist because you know, I, don't, I don't pray. I don't. I, I, in what I would define God to be, I, I live my life as though God doesn't exist. Although I know um, people like Jordan Peterson nowadays, they go, "Well, you know, no one's an atheist because an atheist would just kill themselves." Um, so, uh, what is God? I think if God does exist, uh, it might be some more sort of like ethereal entity. Um, it probably has something to do with consciousness. My guess is. Um, I certainly wouldn't say I've had many like deeply spiritual experiences in my life. Whereas I know people who have, they generally say something like that, like we are all one and you know, something like that. Um, so yeah, the reason why I'm agnostic is because I cannot logically prove that it's not true that when I die, I find myself at the gates of hell uh, with some angel listing off all the times I sinned, of which it would be a long, long list uh, <laughs> Of, of sex before marriage and nothing else. Uh, no, um, uh, no. Uh, but, but, you know, like, there are lots of obscure sins in the Bible, right? And it could be the case that, like, you know, the, the Old Testament is the literal word of God or the New Testament is... I can't prove that... I, I think it would be unfair. I think I would have some issues with that God if they existed. I'd say, I, I think, I think that a lot you did was quite questionable there, mate. Um, but I can't control that's not being true. So I don't know. So um, if God does exist, I suppose I would hope they were benevolent towards us. Um uh, I, I imagine it's something a lot more abstract than I think has been depicted uh, in some in some Western religions. But I, given I'm not even sure they exist, I think I'm the, probably the worst person to ask of what what is God. Um, so, uh, yeah. Do the laws of physics prohibit the existence of a higher power such as God? What we talk about as God? Gosh, I I, I don't think so. I think. Um, to my knowledge, there there isn't any physics that would. So okay, so you could argue that there's nothing in our science which talks about like some being being able to come down and intervene, right? Uh, but then, because we talked about induction earlier, and we talked about the chess 
thing where the, the castle sw- swaps the, the sorry the king swaps with the castle it might be we've just never seen that before and so it's actually totally in line with the laws of the universe we just haven't seen it. or maybe someone has and maybe that's the whole point of jesus and walking on water maybe that's that was the case of that and we just haven't seen it we haven't seen it since so i don't know the laws of physics as there's as far as i'm aware there's no god in them or no god prohibited from them some might say that a god wrote them uh, because they're so perfect and like if they were slightly changed life wouldn't exist and, and all that so um yeah i uh i think not neutral neutral on that i think they have nothing to say about god really uh, explicitly and if they do perhaps they were written by such an entity but again i i don't know i think they just they are just, they are they are just the way they are and final question what is the meaning of life and obviously based on um the previous question and your answer to it I, it's going to be more uh, i assume uh, more Skeptical. of a philosophical <laughs> philosoph- philosophical answer more of a continental philosophical yeah, answer yeah. if you have a, an I, answer well, like that so my, my, my answer to that is like i don't know so let's say let's say we found out the meaning of life uh let's say the meaning of life was to maximize the number of golden retriever puppies that there were on any like given moment of time i don't know how the universe would look any different i don't know what it would look like if there was a meaning for life like you know in a video game uh you can be like the point of this video game when i do this my score goes up and when i don't do these other things my score doesn't go up there's no indication to me like maybe you'd be like oh when we did when we did the meaning of life thing like we get this big like ah like like light from the sky like you've done the right thing um so i don't know uh if there is a meaning i'm certainly not aware of it uh i think uh, for me what's worked out well has been you know having close connections with friends thinking deeply um trying to remove unnecessary pain and suffering uh and um yeah that's all i got so far really i know i know for a lot of people what is it i i think there was an interview i saw once with some military guy on tim ferris's thing and again i'm butchering the quote but it's something like uh the purpose of life is a life of purpose and so i think and there's also a great bruce lee quote where he says sometimes the whole, whole point of having a target is just to have something to hit to aim at uh, and so I do think to a certain extent, while it can be paralyzing, it is arbitrary and that's, that can be liberating. It can be as much as it can be paralyzing, it can be liberating. So, um, yeah. Or, or the, what is it? The um, logo theory from what everyone, Victor Frankl, which everyone quotes when asked this question of like, it's a question that life asks you what the purpose of life is. So you kind of get to decide. So if there is an objective one, I don't know what it is. Maybe there is. I like to think it'd be something really funny. Like when this is all over, God comes down and is like, how could you not tell? Like the whole point, the whole point was to make as many. It's so paper, obvious. The whole point was to make as many paper clips as possible. Like, look how cool paper clips are. Like, how did you not get that? That you, you, you guys messed up. Do you know how much effort it was to make this universe? And we like, I, uh, I'm so sorry. So I don't know if it's something like that. I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, be nice, have some friends, um, do something hard, think, look after yourself, look after your family. That's all I got. That's pretty standard. So, I think it's brilliant, all the same. Uh, Jack, you've blown my mind countless times throughout this Sorry conversation. Sorry, I've been you've, uh, rambling too much. No, no, not at all. You've given me a, a great deal to uh, to think about, to meditate on. Um, yeah, this is exactly what this podcast is all about. So, thank you very much. Yeah, for like great pleasure. Thank it's you so much for having me. Thank you. Awesome.